God morgon Sverige. Good morning. And salamat sore to Indonesia. Salamat datang. Excellencies, business leaders, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends. For both Indonesia and Sweden, oceans are vital for economy, welfare and prosperity. A competitive, innovative and sustainable maritime sector can contribute to increased employment, reduced environmental impact and an attractive living environment. As the Indonesian government is developing a blue economy roadmap to achieve an inclusive and sustainable economy post the pandemic, Sweden has been identified as a strategic partner to develop a blue economy roadmap in line with the Indonesian National Medium Term Development Plan 2020 to 2024. A tool to accomplish this will be to follow up the joint statement signed by the Swedish and Indonesian governments during the visit of Minister Soharso Monoarfa of Bappenas to Sweden in October this year. The joint statement highlights that Indonesia and Sweden will start exploring possibilities for cooperation in the field of blue economy during this CISP week. I'm therefore pleased that during today's session Indonesian and Swedish stakeholders will discuss how the collaboration on blue economy can be developed further in line with COP26 and the Paris Agreement. Leadership on blue economy will also be an important issue for the Indonesians during its G20 presidency, where it will be one of the priorities in the development working group. I wish you all a great success in networking and forming of new business collaboration during this fourth day of CISP, focusing on blue economy. Thank you for your attention, thank you for attending and thank you all for your efforts to strengthen the relations between Indonesia and Sweden. For this fourth day of CISP, we will focus on blue economy in line with the Indonesian National Development Medium Term Development Plan. Joining us in the plenary session will be Minister Soharso Monarfa from the Ministry of Bappenas, together with Director General Jakob Granit from the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. And the Executive Director for Stockholm International Water Institute, Torgny Holmgren. The second session will focus on how blue economy can be the engine of the Indonesian economic transformation. Ibu Wini, Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs from Bappenas, will do this together with Mr. Haye Schitte, Senior Advisor and Head of the Finance and Sustainable Development Division at OECD the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Based on these discussions, the two final sessions will share insights from key sectors in blue economy, as well as the role of the private sector and the innovative technology in paving a path forward to a sustainable ocean economy, as well as to explore potential collaborations. I'm sure you're all aware, the health of the ocean is caught in a cycle of serious decline. The ocean is essentially the lifeblood of our planet. It covers three quarters of the Earth's surface and provides more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe and serves as a crucial buffer to the ever worsening impacts of global warming. The ocean is home to nearly 200,000 distinct identified species. Without a healthy and sustainable ocean, humanity's place on this planet will be in jeopardy.
I now have the pleasure to present one of our keynote speakers, the Director General of the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, Dr. Jakob Granit. Jakob Granit has over 25 years of exper expertise in the field of natural resources and management and development with a focus on water, energy, food, ecosystem nexus. Jakob has worked from an operational perspective on transboundary and national water management and sustainable energy transitions, including hydropower development programs with the World Bank and the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, SIDA. The Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management is the Swedish government agency responsible for freshwater and ocean management, including fisheries management and international cooperation. Jakob, the word is yours. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Berg. I'm wondering if I can I share a screen here. I have I can do that if we want to see some pictures or otherwise I will do it without. Is it possible? It says host has disabled participant sheet screen sharing. I'm wondering if, if I can, can share Jakob. my screen or not. I can. Yes, you can see. share the screen. Yes, Jakob. Now I can do that. Excellent. So very good. I'm sorry, I have been a little bit of a, a technological challenge this morning uh, after a very long time of, of uh, working from a distance, as we all have done, many of us at least, during the pandemic. So I'm sorry for, for having had uh, uh, some ch technical challenges. I, I hope you can see my screen now and hear me well. And I'm very happy to uh, joining uh, this panel today. And uh, thanks Perfect. so much for, for uh, the organization of this very important event on the blue economy and uh, our oceans. And uh, uh, to learn more also about uh, the important work uh, Minister and his team and the country are doing in, in Indonesia moving forward with the, with the blue economy. Uh, let me just provide you with uh, a very brief outline on, on some of the work we are doing here in Sweden as a contribution to, to the discussion. We, uh, uh, we have had some, or have some, and I will just briefly refer to them, some major challenges relating to the ecosystem uh, of our oceans and our, or also of our freshwater system. So it's a connected whole. Uh, and this was the reason why this agency, uh, the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management was created uh, back in 2010, 2010, 11, we have been now in existence for 10 years. So we saw that the, our ocean ecosystems was deteriorating quite rapidly, but also uh, that our freshwater system needed some, some proper attention. And as being also EU members, there were some stringent uh, directives uh, that were then transposed into national law uh, that pushed also Sweden to move forward with particularly in the freshwater management uh, domain, but also in the in the marine space. So uh, in 2009, there had been a number of, of, of parliamentary inquiries and also by the government. And at the end, it was uh, sort of decided that uh, Sweden as a whole would work towards implementing a cohesive marine resources and water management policy. That is to try to keep these two the connected water system as a whole. And then this agency was created to take up that work as a national agency, guiding uh, uh, our county boards and municipalities in that work. So our, the agency uh, is in that sense uh, quite uh, unique. It has that uh, task to work on the freshwater management domain, the marine water management domain, but also fisheries management and fisheries management and control. So the agency was partly created out of, of the fisheries, uh, fisheries agency that we had in existence before, and then the perspective was, was broadened. So our key uh, view of work 
is to really see how these systems connect. And as we all understand, our societies are very much working uh, deep into certain sectors and we will never have a fully integrated system here in place or, or from a management perspective. But what we can do and what, what we are doing is to work towards coordination between the different domains, having an impact on the environment, but also then contributing to the sustainable use of it. So we work very much uh, in tandem with our sister agency, the Swedish EPA, um, other agency working on energy transitions, uh, the grid companies, uh, companies working in agriculture, agencies working in agriculture and so on, to really provide this, this, this coordinated approach of governance, which is, I think, what we hope will uh, see some successes moving forward. Uh, in 2015, uh, the topic of, of really sustainable use of the, these resources uh, became important for the government. So we, uh, the government created this new strategy, a maritime strategy for people, jobs and the environment, which is essentially our terminology for our blue economy. And it has an, uh, done a number of pillars, as you can see here, a healthy and safe marine environment, knowledge and innovation, maritime spatial planning, uh, rules, efficient rules and permit processes, international cooperation and conditions for the business sector. So we are many uh, government agencies working on different parts of this. And I will just make a few examples of, of our contribution to this whole, uh, bearing in mind that we then work uh, you know, in coordination with other agencies. The idea then is that it will work towards uh, of competitive marine industries, attractive coastal areas, of course, which is relevant for Indonesia, obviously, and then a balanced marine environment. As I mentioned, uh, the key challenge we have when it comes to our oceans is that we are surrounded by two major ocean areas, the Baltic Sea to the east and then the Western Seas. Western Seas are connected to the, to the North Sea and the Atlantic, so they have a much more broader ocean system that uh, uh, with, with stronger currents that they can uh, mix and take care of a lot of the pollution. But the inland or the semi-enclosed Baltic Sea uh, has that situation that is enclosed and very shallow. So it's extremely sensitive for climate change. We are experiencing some significant heat waves in this shallow inland sea surrounded by nine uh, uh, other countries around it and 14 countries in the, in the drainage basin. So in the 1950s, we could really begin to see the, the significant problems uh, that had been built up over the years. Eutrophication, that is too much nutrients have been loaded into the system that led to excessive algae blooms, spread then into dead sea bottoms with a major impact on our fisheries, for example. The biodiversity status, uh, is also um, uh, severely impacted. I think we have only, the numbers are quite bad, 40% of our fish stocks are currently sustainably fished. Hazardous substances in the semi-enclosed Baltic Sea are, are, are significant. And then we now can also see many emerging issues, such as marine litter and plastics, pharmaceutical residues, underwater sound, uh, and so forth. And also another challenge that we are experiencing is the, is the significant amount of invasive species. So this is, of course, a rather bleak picture, but uh, the, the idea here is of course, that we work now uh, on these from many, many perspectives, and I'll give you a brief overview of that. On the topic of the innovation, knowledge and innovation, just to mention that these are interconnected systems and, and in Sweden, 40% uh, of our 45% 40, of our hydro, uh, electric system is based upon hydropower. And the hydropower system is even more important today as we have moved into more wind power, intermittent wind power, and solar power in our system. It functions as a battery, essentially. But there are 2,400 hydropower plants in the country, and they have had a major impact on the ecosystems that prevented fish migration. They have stopped sedimentation into the coastal areas. So there are significant impacts here. And now we are addressing them in a major program, reviewing all 
2,400 hydropower plants in a 20 year plan. All will have new environmental permits, bearing then in mind that the environmental perspective should be balanced with the perspective of producing renewable energy and supporting the transition to 100% uh, fully renewable electric system by 2040. So that's an example of addressing environment and then maintaining the, uh, the, uh, the importance of our electric system as we move forward. On the topic of uh, uh, fishing, which is very important also as an example of innovation, we now have to address this as a whole. That's what we see. We have very much different sector legislation from the EU perspective, the common fisheries policy, but also national legislation. But at the end, it's one fish resource. And uh, to make it more sustainable, the fishing opportunities, and as well as the, the oceans themselves, we now have to address this from a multi-sector perspective. So we work very stringently on the habitats, restoring freshwater and coastal seas habitats. We're working, as I mentioned, on the water quality topic. Uh, previously, it was much work on the point source pollution, so obviously, but now it's more the diffuse source pollution from agriculture, for example, uh, that we have to address. The climate change issue is severe, as I mentioned, uh, and also we can see that our ecosystem is responding very rapidly and changing quite rapidly. For example, we had at the in the 1970s, we had about 2,000 gray seals left in the Baltic Sea from a stock of about 100,000 in the turn of the last century. But now that's bounced back uh, and we have 80,000 seals back again. Which, of course, has a very big impact on, on the fisheries stocks. And also, it's a competition for fishermen. So new challenges have emerged. But at the end, it's this holistic picture that we believe will be the opportunity to restore fishing opportunities and recreate them the ecosystem. Uh, just a, another example that I, I know we talked about when I met colleagues uh, from Indonesia before, uh, the topic of uh, fisheries control, very important in our context. We are also working under EU law on that. And the idea here is to be able to see how fish were in slandered, how it comes into the market, and how it's in purchased and, and uh, to the retail sector. So we are now tracking with electronic means this whole chain for the benefit of the fish stocks, of course, to prevent IUU fishing, illegal fishing, but also to prevent uh, uh, solid information for the customer at the end. Uh, and then maybe what I think is, is probably the most important for us moving forward is uh, our marine spatial plans, uh, also again an EU directive uh, that's been implemented. And it is the frame for our work in our ocean space, conserving it, but also then developing it. So this relates to all the major sectors such as navigation, fisheries, energy development uh, is also uh, the topic of defense and marine protected areas. So we are looking at that whole for our Baltic Sea with our neighbors and as well for the Nordic Sea with our neighbors. And a key driver now for Sweden with our marine spatial planning is really, as you can see here, wind farms. Uh, we are looking today, we have planned for about 30 new uh, terawatt hours of, of uh, offshore wind farms in our system. But the new instructions from the government is to look at as much as up to 100 terawatt hours, which is essentially the need for transforming our electricity system and being able to cope with new energy demands. So this is a significant task and there's not much space because of all these different demands, but it's really a driver for, for developing the system and conserving it. So I think the electricity sector here will be very, very important for us moving forward in our planning domains. And that's also why I showed the, the um, hydropower sector because this is an integrated electricity system also connected throughout the Nordic countries. So we have to look at the fresh water and the ocean system in tandem in that regard. And my final uh, uh, contribution to the discussion is on the international cooperation area then. And uh, what we can see a major driver for, for Sweden, but also for the EU, of course, is to uh, uh, move heavy into the sector of digitization 
the use of big data, AI, and communications. So essentially, everything we are doing today is, is fully digitized. We are creating systems where, where you have information domains distributed among special agencies, but connected so that we can really tap into all the environmental data and create new applications for the public sector, but also for the private sector. And this is also a topic that we are contributing with into the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It's one of the key areas, including ecosystem-based management. So these two things come together. And making use of our common resources, so, such as Copernicus, the EU system of satellites, is really uh, changing the way we have been managing our resources and creates a great opportunity for the future. So with that, I, I thank for this uh, very brief introduction of our work and, and uh, look forward to hear more from our Indonesian colleagues and join the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jakob Granit, for sharing the valuable uh, uh, insights from your agency, the competences that you uh, have uh, within the agency and that you yourself uh, here can present. The, the, the work you're doing is very, very broad and the spectra of issues are, are in a way overwhelming for us, but so important, the knowledge and competences that you have and that you have within your agency is needed internationally, that is for sure. Thank you so much. And I will now uh, turn to our next keynote speaker, His Excellency Minister Soharso Monoarfa, the Minister of National Development Planning, BAPANAS, and a member of the Presidential Advisory Council. Minister Monoarfa, I would also like to take this opportunity to say how thankful I am for the successful visit of yours in Sweden in October this year, as well as our discussions on blue economy and potential cooperation between our countries. This day is specifically devoted to follow up on those discussions. So ladies and gentlemen, I now have the honor to present Minister Monoarfa. Minister, the word is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Uh, Marina Brock, uh, High Excellency, Ambassador of Sweden for Indonesia, Ms. Marina Brock. His Excellency, uh, Yang Terhormat Pak Duta Besar, Pak Kama Pradipta, Duta Besar Indonesia di Sweden, Halo Hadir. His Excellency, Mr. Jacob uh, Grani, Sweden State Secretary, to uh, Minister for Health and Social Affairs, His Excellency Mr. Rockney Holmgren, Executive Director at Stockholm International Water Institute, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good day and uh, best wishes for all of us. Uh, uh, first of all, we express our gratitude to the Ambassador and Business uh, Sweden uh, for hosting the Sweden Indonesia Sustainability Partnership Week 2021. We take advantage of this opportunity to strengthen collaboration between Indonesia and Swedish uh, stakeholders. Uh, particularly in the development of the blue economy. Sweden and Indonesia share numerous opportunities and challenges in the blue economy. Sweden has recently developed its maritime strategy and Indonesia has developed a blue economy development framework as part of its effort to accelerate economic transformation to a more inclusive and sustainable development. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, during my visit to Sweden, I met with His Excellency Per Bolun, the Swedish Minister for Environment and Climate, and His Excellency Thomas Enneroth, the Swedish Minister for Infrastructure, 
as well as a variety of Swedish uh, stakeholders, including government agencies, research institutions, and private uh, companies. Indonesia and Sweden agreed to sign a joint statement on blue economic cooperation on October 25th. The joint declaration will serve as the foundation for future collaboration between the two countries. As a result, there will be follow-up discussion and bilateral activities, strategies for sustainable recovery and development. We also look forward to the support, the support from Swedish uh, stakeholders for Indonesia to develop the blue economy uh, roadmap. As an archipelagic country with an ocean covering more than two thirds of its land area reaching 6.4 million kilometers square and the second longest coastline in the world reaching 108,000 kilometers, Indonesia has an advantage of marine natural resources. The ocean provides many economic potential, mainly fisheries, biotechnology, marine tourism, transport, maritime industry and services, and also mining, energy, and non-conventional resources. It is estimated that Indonesian ocean economy potential reach to 1.3 billion US dollar and could provide job to 45 million people. Coral reef as a key ecosystem in the ocean serve an important role for marine economic such as tourism, fisheries and coastal infrastructure development. If we manage the coral reef sustainably, it is estimated that an, an additional of 37 billion US dollars can be created in the Indonesian economy by 2030. Indonesia's strategic position has also provided opportunity for Indonesia to influence regional economic stability, as well as to lead in sustainable blue development. No wonder this requirements are in line with the country's future challenges which include coastal and natural resource degradation, climate change, and ocean pollution. With a recovering ocean and coastal ecosystem, a sustainable and prosperous blue economy on could contribute to higher revenue for, from ocean-based activities that could be channeled, uh, channeled back into ocean conservation encourage sustainable livelihood for coastal communities and preserve ocean biodiversity. Blue recovery in particular has the potential to transform the existing ocean-based industry into long-term engines to our shared growth and prosperity by serving as a model for sustainable marine-based industry development Indonesia's transition to a blue economy is expected to reduce the country's economic reliance on extractive sectors. Indonesia has uh, developed a blue economy development framework to serve as a solid foundation for future blue economy policy planning and implementation in Indonesia. And to be the first stepping stone for Sweden, Indonesia, and OECD to work together on developing the Indonesian Blue Economy Roadmap. The framework takes an integrated and comprehensive approach, including the enormous potential of Indonesian ocean resources, the need to increase synergies among actors and sectors, as well as several opportunities and challenges. The framework also aligns with the national medium term development plan that improving the management of the blue sector is one of the keys to achieving Indonesia's development agenda. 
addition, this is also aligned with the sustainable development goals, especially goals number 14 on the fund policy conservation and sustainable use of the ocean, seas, and ocean resources for sustainable development. One of which is indicated by an increase in, in economic benefits from the sustainable use and conservation of ocean resources. Furthermore, it also links to other goals such as goal number seven on affordable and clean energy, goal number eight on decent work and economic growth, goal number nine on industry innovation and infrastructure, as well as goal number 70 on partnership for the goals. This is like, ladies and gentlemen, today's Today's series of discussion on the economy will become opportunities for us to sharpen our policy formulation and strategies, to create a balance between conservation and sustainable use and management of ocean and coastal resources, as well as to create welfare for our people and contribute to a, a global transition to a more sustainable ocean economy and prosperity. We look forward to a fruitful discussion today and future collaboration to the formulation of new economic development roadmap for Indonesia. From then, Indonesia will also put the blue economy agenda in G20 next year under the development of the group. We hope that Indonesia, Sweden, and OECD can jointly host a site in G20 in 2022 to publish the blue economy roadmap as a deliverable of our collaboration. And at this important event, I will take the opportunity to launch a book of Blue Economic Development Framework for Indonesia's Economic Transformation, which can be used by everyone as a reference in defining Blue Economy as a new engine of Indonesian sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Monwarfa, for valuable insights and perspectives. And we are also very thankful for the joint statement. And we look forward to working together and look deeper into the Blue Economy Framework. The work you have done so far is impressive. I now have the pleasure to present to you our next keynote speaker, um, Mr. Torgny Holmgren who is the Executive Director of Stockholm International Water Institute. Mr. Togni Holmgren used to be Ambassador at the uh, Foreign Ministry for Foreign Affairs. He headed the Department for Development Cooperation Policy. Torgny, the word is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Barry Marina, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this very important event. And myself, I had the pleasure to uh, meet uh, Minister Monarfa and uh, your delegation from Indonesia in Stockholm a few weeks ago, and also receive a, a delegation to our headquarters at the Stockholm International Water Institute. 
And uh, we are, the Stockholm International Water Institute, we are a leading expert in water governance. That is what we do. We do arrange the annual World Water Week, final week of August every year. We do award the Stockholm Water Prize and we do advisory services around the world on different topics. And today I'm going to speak our work in linking fresh water and ocean. But we are also a curator of change, a champion solutions and also for a just, prosperous and sustainable future. I do have some slides that I have shared with the organizers so maybe we can put on them right now and this is the starting one and just uh, before going into the main subject. Uh, the role of uh, ocean in achieving sustainable development is in keeping to the commitment of the Paris Agreement to maximum of 1.5 degrees Celsius is becoming more and more clear. We had arranged in Glasgow and I was there myself a few weeks ago at the COP and arranged a water pavilion. Actually, it was next door to the very impressive Indonesian pavilion in, 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 in Glasgow. So in short, we need a healthy ocean to achieve the aims. And it's all our business to make sure that we have a healthy ocean. And that leads me to my first slide. So next slide, please. Good. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development forms an integrated plan window for the future. No one goal of this 18 or 17 goals can be met if other goals are not met. However, the four goals at the bottom of this wedding cake, number 6, 13, 14, 15, which is water, climate, ocean, and land-based activities, they form the foundation for, foundation for achieving all the goals. And this foundation is the starting point for the blue economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that we need to strengthen our resilience to unanticipated future shocks. And that resilience builds up from how well we meet the targets for water, climate, ocean, and biodiversity. Turning then to the next slide. Our stumbling blocks, and the one stumbling block that keeps us from making the intended progress on the SDGs at, at the large is our fragmented siloed approach. Too often policies and practice, strategies and finance are developed in isolation, looking at only one sector or a single geographic location at the time. And governance is also fragmented with water, urban development, coastal zone management, and marine policies all too often uh, being developed independently without consideration of their impacts on other sectors or in other locations. We see that the land, fresh water, coast and ocean must be managed as one interconnected continuum from source to sea. This range is linked together by water, biota, sediment, pollutants, the built environment and ecosystem services. To address these linkages, we promote a source to sea management as a holistic approach. Upstream and downstream stakeholder interests and trade-offs should be considered to find the greatest mutual benefits across the source to sea system. And source to sea management also implies that there should be a coordination between all sectors to ensure coherence in policies and practice. So reinforcing the upstream downstream cooperation across sectoral coordination can avoid unintended negative consequences and also give rise to innovative solutions to address the development challenges that we do face. Let's turn me to the next slide, please. Yeah, the ocean we know, we all know, is in trouble. For too long, we have seen the ocean as a convenient dumping ground all over the world. We have imagined that its bounty is limitless and available for the taking. And we have allowed ourselves to let the unseen be invisible for us. And this has put us all on a very dangerous trajectory and one that we urgently need to move away from. With some aspects of the demise of the oceans have originated from actions in the ocean itself, but the vast majority arise from land-based activities, the way in which we use and manage land, water and coasts. So to build a vibrant blue economy, we must work upstream on the land, in the water and along the coasts. 
and we must take into account how the upstream activities impact downstream and the ocean. And we must see the system as one indivisible whole, the land, fresh water, coast and ocean. And next slide, please. And we at CEVI, we have brought together a group of organizations who recognize that we must address development challenges holistically. So we did create the action platform from source to sea management. And this platform has more than 30 partners who work together to break down the silos that keep us from holistic source to sea management. Through peer-to-peer -peer learning, we expand our understanding of source to sea challenges and the solutions that will lead us to sustainable development. Together, we build commitment so that policies and finance stimulate source to sea action and ultimately that we take action on the ground. The platform is open to organizations committed to holistic management of land, freshwater, coast and ocean. And you're very welcome to join the platform and we work very closely with uh, Jakob Granit and our colleagues at the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, as well as uh, Mr. His, His Excellency Mr. Peter Thompson, who was also uh, sharing the video in the start of this session, uh, Special Envoy and Jürgen for Ocean Affairs. Uh, next slide, please. And we also have a growing library of knowledge products, case studies, policy briefs, and uh, other resources that can help you as you work toward achieving the 2030 agenda and meeting the Paris Agreement and building a blue economy. So we encourage you all to reach out to us and learn more from what we have at, uh, at your disposal. So in closing, I'm very excited to see that Indonesia is working on the blue economy roadmap and bringing this into the G20 process and presidency. And as I have said, this is a journey that requires strong partnership across all sectors and needs to be done with full engagement of upstream actors and with other countries. So if we go to the next slide, please, you will have our, our, our uh, uh, internet connection. And the cooperation between Sweden and Indonesia is most important in this context. And we stand ready to work with you and share our experience in bringing people together to reach a common vision from source to sea. Thank you. Thank you, Tony Holmgren. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, the work CV is doing, very important. Definitely actions that needs to be taken has to be comprehensive and collective. I would like to take this advantage to turn over to you again with a few questions, with a couple of questions. Jakob Granit, I'd like to turn to you first. Uh, water is the base of blue economy and the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management has national responsibility. Can you share with us uh, what this means and how you work on blue economy in Sweden? Thank you. Uh, uh, a broad question, and I think I, I tried to um, partly respond to it uh, initially in my, in my presentation. But I think what, what, what is a key lesson learned for us here, here in Sweden is that, uh, uh, in essence, we did not see the change uh, in our ecosystems coming. Uh, in Sweden, we are well endowed with water resources, as you are in Indonesia, both fresh and uh, marine water resources. But we did not really see the change in those resources and how they impacted uh, uh, our, our current economies. So it wasn't, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't until quite late that we saw the, the impact, especially on the Baltic system in the Maybe in the 1950s, we started to understand that we are having a heavy impact uh, on the coastal zones and also in the open sea. That, that was a surprise that, that it, it, we had really had an impact on the whole open ocean space because of our, our practices on land primarily, but also because uh, that, that I referred to agriculture, nutrient runoff, point source pollution and those type of issues. Uh, but also through uh, the, the significant amount of navigation with the number of oil spills and, and uh, risks to the ecosystems because of that. So 
it, 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 it was late, uh, one can argue, in Sweden, uh, that we really understood that as a society, we have a major impact uh, on the coastal zones and on the open sea. So that to, to come back and to be able to address those issues uh, uh, when they are almost too late, I think is a, is a very important uh, lessons learned because uh, it is costly. It takes a very, very long time. And uh, the result is ambiguous. Uh, Right now, we have a major discussion in Sweden, and this is primarily driven by, by civil society also, that uh, people do not see the, um, the impacts on clean water, for example, along the coastal lines, the, the lack of, of fishing for sport fishing, for recreational fishing, but also the depletion of our fish stocks. It's apparent to, to, to uh, members of society. And... Uh, uh, they say it's enough. And then the government, uh, uh, we and everybody else have been investing heavily into addressing the issue, issues. But the, the, the time lag before you see a change is very, very long. Uh, and maybe when it comes to the Baltic Sea, we might even not get back to uh, our ambitions, which would be a clean sea, which is at the state, you know, with the nice uh, sick depth and so forth that we had in the 1950s. It is a changed system. And uh, that realization I think is difficult uh, uh, for us. And the same uh, when it comes to the freshwater resources and you heard Torgny Holmgren speak about this connected whole as well as I did, how we tried to address this. We also, we had the opinion that we thought that we were, you know, water, fresh water resource is not a problem. We have plenty of it and good quality. But when we really started to look into this in detail, we saw the major impacts in particular from, from hydropower development on the whole system. So also, as I mentioned, to begin a 20 year plan to provide an industry that has been around for maybe two, 300 years in Sweden or hydropower development. And, to create that change and provide new environmental permits for industries that have been around for so long time. It's very, very difficult because these systems have been well entrenched in, in, in local communities, in some, some of them, the smaller ones, and the larger ones have totally transformed the landscape that are necessary for our energy transition. So, I think the key thing that we, we are trying to do now, we are trying to address these issues, but we are doing it late. Uh, and maybe in Indonesia, uh, you have your framework in place and uh, maybe you, have, you are sort of a little bit early in the game here, earlier in the game and can address these issues before you see the main impacts on the coastal zones and on the fisheries, for example, if you take two industries. Uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, I must say, to, to now try to do marine spatial planning, for example, in, the, in, a, in a very tight space with a lot of industries uh, that all have competing interests, it's not easy. As a matter of fact, uh, our government has not yet approved our marine, um, marine spatial plans, and they have been there now for almost two years uh, uh, for a government decision. And it's because there are competing interests, very difficult ones defense, energy, for example, that are competing. So I think the, um, uh, the, the, what I would like to say here on this topic, uh, Ambassador Berg, is that the earlier one can plan uh, and then see these changes and monitor them uh, before they, they happen, plan with scenarios, for example, to see what can be the impact, the better it is, because to address them afterwards, what we are trying to do now, to untap the, the economic opportunities it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob, for ending with a little bit of positive note, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I will turn also, of course, to Torgny Holmgren before uh, we end up this session uh, with a question to you, Torgny. 
Source to sea management is a novel approach that has been gaining traction around the world as more countries recognize the importance of upstream downstream connections that's, uh, as you were talking about. So how does source to sea management feature these connections? Uh, thank you. I think I could mention three or four items here. First for me, it's so important that we break out of the siloed approach. I was myself a few years ago part of setting up the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN Commission. And we know that we have the 17 goals, but of course, if we do just focus on each and every goal, we will not end up what we would like to do to end poverty and also get a more healthy and prosperous planet. So that I think is linking the SDG 6 and SDG 14, the fresh water and the ocean together in the joint approach. That is the key for this. And I think what we are doing and what we are promoting here is that the interconnection, policy advice, finance, but also awareness raising. And that I brought with me from, from Glasgow, that to a large extent, we are still working on different sectors in our societies, but bringing it together, that is the key to, to make us also achieve the Paris Agreement. So, uh, the whole of government approach linking these two, SDG 6 and SDG 14, through the source to sea uh, uh, approach. And we know by strengthening the coordination between sectors, we, are, we will be able to achieve what we would like to achieve. And one very um, tangible example of, of this is, of course, plastic litter in the ocean. Of course, some of it comes from the ocean, or not, activities on the ocean itself, but the main part is carried by water from land-based activities. And that is why we link to, need to link the upstream and downstream activities to much larger extent. And that we also see in our area of the world, in the Baltic Sea, what we have the more or less Dead Sea, uh, also to a large extent um, impacted by land-based activities. So now to finalize my, my comment on this, I think Indonesia has a, a golden opportunity running the G20 presidency for the next year to bringing this together, because that I think is what it's all about, to coordinate, bring sectors and finance, which also was discussed at length in, in, in Glasgow together on the, on, from the climate sense, but running your development working group and bringing this aspect of your blue economy focus and bringing in the fresh water, I think that will make an, a, a change. So thank you. Thank you, Torgny, for insight full uh, answer, um, very structured. Um, I, we are running a little bit sh short of time, but I have one more question to Jakob Granit, if, if that is okay. Uh, as you know, Jakob, Indonesia is developing a roadmap for blue economy, as you also mentioned. What would be the main lessons learned in Sweden that can be shared with Indonesia? Right, I, I, I should not be too negative because that's not my intention here, uh, minister and ambassador. It's just to say, as I mentioned, that the better one, you know, plan for the future, the better it is. And I think uh, I, I so strongly, of course, support uh, the work that uh, CV is doing and that we have been doing for many years now to try to do this cohesive planning. Uh, but maybe one, one more item on this that I think is important for us, uh, for all of us to work on together, is the topic of, of uh, data and monitoring and try to understand these systems better. So I, I would very much uh, urge for, for, uh, for you know, perhaps collaboration in the area of, of, of science in this area to understand better how these ecosystems function. Um, we both share... Uh, we have archipelagos in the Indonesian archipelago, as we heard from the minister, is a, is a tremendous archipelago, 17,000 islands, and, and we have also in the Baltic Sea a, a unique uh, a shared archipelago between um, Sweden and Finland. And uh, what we can see from, from our work there is that we need also to work very closely with our neighbors. And, and when it comes to topic of understanding these ecosystems, for example, to also see where do you put your marine reserves? In what, what areas do you need to protect? It's not evident uh, uh, that you put them always you know, in your own territory, perhaps, it's in the case of the Baltic, but you might want to look for the opportunities together. 
So in that area, for example, if we are now moving towards a 30% protection, for example, of the oceans and lands, which is, is an ambition in the, in the CBD, which is a very important uh, ambition, then to work together to identify where do you put those uh, parks, marine protected areas, based on, on proper science. And in that regard, the, the, the dig digital area, area can really help us uh, understanding this much better than before. So we have fantastic opportunities today with, with underwater science, with uh, remote sensing, to really understand the system much better and do our planning much smarter to avoid you know, consequences later on. So I think this is something that uh, uh, would be a main lessons learned from us to, to, uh, to share and maybe also to work on together and on topic of, of science and understanding and data driven research uh, to, to see how we plan this better together. So uh, I would say that uh, I would I stop that and thank you so much for that opportunity. Thank you, Jakob Granit, and also thank you, Togni Holmgren. Uh, sharing technology, sharing experience and knowledge, that's key, definitely. And also, listen to research. We know that. And thank you so much for not just sharing what you are doing in your different agency, but also how you are working. I must say that I think one of the comparative advantages Sweden has is, is to cooperate together, to coordinate between actors, agencies and, and companies as well, between the private sector, academia and research uh, and, and agency, the government sector. So um, I couldn't be thankful enough. Thank you so much. Sweden can be a key driver, definitely, not least when it comes to the integrated approach in relation to innovation and te technology. We hope that we can continue working together between your agencies and Indonesian uh, counterparts to develop further how we can share the knowledge uh, and also develop uh, cooperation within Blue Economy together between Sweden and Indonesia. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I will, we will take a very short break. to introduce Indonesia's Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs at Bappenas, Amalia Adiningar Vidyasanti. The Deputy Minister is responsible for formulating, implementing and controlling the Indonesia National Development Plans. Ibu Winni, as she is called, is thus certainly an important person in deepening and broadening the relationship between our countries within Blue Economy. So, Ibuini, the word is yours. Uh, let me share the, the screen from my computer. First of all, I would like to thank to Ambassador Marina and Eric to uh, give us an opportunity to share our thought on what is the potential of blue economy for Indonesian future economic transformation. In this regard, as um, our minister just now launched, uh, the minister launched, uh, it is a kind of a starting, a starting stepping stone for Indonesia to move forward. And that's why what uh, the minister launched just now. Ibu, is about I believe we lost your voice. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Claire. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that's why when uh, the minister just launched is about Blue Economy Development Framework for Indonesian Economic Transformation. Uh, I would like to start with, uh, to share uh, this with you all, that Bapanas at this time 
is now starting to design to redesign the economic transformation of Indonesia for inclusive and sustainable development. So we have the big strategies that will be under the new economic transformation agenda. And if you look at under strategy number three, then blue economy is one of the important strategy to pursue the Indonesian new economic transformation agenda. So with that, uh, the book is actually to set the context on the role of blue economy for Indonesia, especially on how blue economy can be a powerful tool for Indonesian economic development and how blue economy later on will be the new engine of economic recovery and economic transformation in Indonesia. As we can refer to the other references as well, that there is like a global trend as well, that there is like the need of using the ocean as a tool for global economic recovery. So with that, there is like the urgency of blue economy development in Indonesia, because there has a huge potential, but until now it is not has been explored optimally to create values from ocean resources. So uh, blue economy is actually indispensable for Indonesia's economic transformation because as you know that Indonesia consisting of 17,500 islands and 15% of it is actually area covered by ocean or sea. And uh, we have exclusive economic zone and also about 80,000 kilometer coastline. And uh, we also facing the need to recover very soon from the pandemic. And we also have an ambition to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030. And we also have to optimize our Indonesia's marine resource potential as declared by our predecessor. Uh, we call it Juanda Declaration, and we also have uh, blue economy is an integral part for local economic development. So with that, uh, we would like to share with you our thought that the scope of blue economy is actually the new economic paradigm. Uh, for uh, supporting the economic growth, actually we can use a conventional economy or we can use the new economic paradigm. But we now, uh, now in the future, we would like to more on the right side that we have to pursue the new economic paradigm to find the new engine of economic growth and blue economy will take in, in, uh, an important part of it because Indonesia is a archipelagic country and we have to be able to create value added and improving productivity from marine-based economy because it is very potential for us to achieve inclusive and sustainable economic growth. And there is a lot of new economic opportunity for Indonesia from marine-based economy. As you know, and I would like to underline as well, that blue economy is actually not about one sector, but it, is co it covers many sectors and cross-sectoral cross issues, such as marine tourism, fishery industry, shipping industry, bioeconomy and biotechnology will be in there as well, sea logistics, renewable energy, uh, research and education, especially or, or, or innovation technology, and as well as ocean waste management. Uh, so with that, uh, SDGs and economic transformation will be uh, or like uh, uh, two vehicles to promote uh, the blue economy. So with that, uh, uh, there is also the need for all of us to shift from traditional sectors towards the upgrading economic values and sustainable growth. Uh, we know that there is like traditional sectors such as marine living uh, extraction, marine non-living uh, uh, sector, trade and, 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 and other, and tourism. But the thing is that when we are talking marine living sector, then there are unsustainability practices, lack of technical skills, 
and raw material shortages and also low technology then there is an opportunity for Indonesia to move towards the more value added marine living industries and we also need to move towards uh, and to take the opportunity to create values from marine non living industries and there is also an opportunity for Indonesia to work on more quality tourism we would like to uh, uh, to leave the unsustainability practices in our tourism sectors and we would like to move towards the sustainable tourism and more quality tourism and marine tourism is one of the opportunity for us to do that uh, so there is also uh, emerging sectors that can be uh, created from marine uh, uh, industry from marine uh, or from blue economy those are uh, renewable energy and there is like a, a trend global trend that uh, in the future uh, the global economy will move towards bioeconomy uh, supported by biotechnology and as you know that we have abundant resources of algae biomass uh, such as macroalgae, macroalgae, seaweeds, and spirulina. And also, we have a lot of opportunity to provide and to create biotechnology can create a higher and an advanced value added to Indonesian economy. So with that, we need research and development, we need technology, we need collaboration, and also more, 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 moreover, that we need consistency and commitment among the stakeholders. And uh, uh, furthermore, I would like also to, 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 to say that there are many potential emerging sectors uh, that can be extracted from blue economy, such as research and education, environment and resources. As we know that uh, we need also a better education to make the new generation to fully understand how to maximize the economic and social benefits from marine potential with while we are also preserving the environment in the long term. And we also need to generate economic and social benefits while we can ensure oceans for long-term environmental sustainability. So meaning that we can provide a better balance between economic benefits, social benefits, and environmental benefits when we are creating values of blue economy. So that's why uh, oh, we already identified so far, we have in Indonesia uh, already enabling policy framework uh, already on the ground to promote blue economy. We have legal frameworks governing the ocean environment issues and uh, and the enabler uh, policy for the blue economy uh, is already in there and indonesia also have commitments in international cooperation such as uh, there is a declaration of the indian ocean rim association on the blue economy in the indian ocean region there is also already ASEAN leaders declaration on the blue economy in 2021. And uh, recently, uh, as mentioned by, by my minister and also by Ambassador Marina, there have been a joint statement on cooperation in the field of blue economy between Sweden and Indonesia. And last but not least, there is also already Australia Indonesia joint statement on cooperation on the green economy and energy transition. So uh, besides that, uh, other ministry in Indonesia already have a sustainable ocean economy agenda that can be can that that can be integrated into one framework. And Indonesia established a dedicated ocean policy strategy. Uh, and the Coordinating Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Investment um, uh, coordinating this. And uh, this is supported by other ministries, uh, including BAPENAS. So uh, this is the milestone on how Sweden and Indonesia can collaborate further on blue economy. We know that uh, after we have a joint statement on blue economy and we have today 
uh, Sweden Indonesia Sustainability Partnership session on blue economy. And from there, it will be a good start for Sweden, Indonesia, and recently OECD also would like to join to prepare together the master plan on blue economy of Indonesia. And uh, besides that, the blue economy agenda, as mentioned by our minister, will also be put as a priority to be discussed in development working group in G20. And uh, we, are we, we, ex we are expecting that in October 2022, we can deliver a joint event between Indonesia, Swedia, and o OECD to launch the Ibu Economy Master Plan on the sideline of G20. And we, don't, we, we will not stop there because we still have another agenda in 2023. We'll put forward the economy in ASEAN meetings and Sweden also will put forward the economy in European meetings when Sweden hosting the European meetings in 2023. Uh, the way forward, I would like to uh, mention that it is about, actually it is about a transition to a better state. We have to, to, to do a, a change from conventional economy towards new economy paradigm where blue economy in it. Secondly, we have to shift from traditional sectors towards new emerging value creation. Thirdly, we have to move from inward looking paradigm into forward looking paradigm and fourthly, we need to move from local context into the global context. And we we'll also will uh, move forward and bring from blue economy development framework and we will create a blue economy roadmap for Indonesia's economic transformation agenda. So with that, we look forward to working together with Sweden and OECD and other stakeholders as well to materialize the blue economy development in Indonesia. Thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ibu Winnie, for clarifying the vast scope of the blue economy encompassing so many sectors and then also telling us more about the collaboration that we have in front of us. It is good to also hear from the third partner in this work of preparing a roadmap on blue economy, so OECD. Therefore, it is time for me now to introduce our next keynote speaker, Mr. Haye Schütte, who is Senior Counselor and Head of Financing for Sustainable Development Division of the OECD Development Corporation Directorate. His work focuses on how to address the dual challenges at the core of the 2030 Agenda. For example, mobilizing unprecedented volumes of resources and leaving no one behind. So Mr. Schütte, the word is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to, to be with you this afternoon and I would really like to uh, how wholeheartedly thank the organizers uh, for giving the OECD to say a few words about uh, our work on, uh, on the sustainable ocean economy, but also about the collaboration between uh, Indonesia and uh, OECD on the subject. So I have prepared a couple of slides, so my team have prepared a couple of slides. So if I could uh, have them, that would be uh, just uh, excellently. Now I say a few words that I think excellently uh, contributes the, the really insightful presentation by uh, Deputy Minister Ivo Vini. Um, if I could have the slides uh, coming up. Um, and uh, yes, thank you so much. And if I could have the next slide, please, kindly. Um, basically, prior to the, to the crisis that you see depicted here, the OECD estimated that the ocean economy would double in size between 2010 and 2030, outpacing the overall growth of the rest of the economy. Now, in recent years, there has been something that we refer to as the blue acceleration. So a rapid acceleration of the economic activity taking place in the ocean, 
or using ocean uh, resources. Uh, and then sectors that have been uh, uh, seen a very particular expansion have been marine agriculture, or offshore winds and port activities, as well as tourism and cruise shipping. Now, obviously, as the minister also referred to, based on that uh, growth, such uh, you know, growth uh, will also put additional pressures on the marine environment, and we expect those pressures to increase. Could we have the next slide, please? Now, across countries, there are different trends and also significant variations in the potential benefits and the risk of the economy. Now, East Asia and Pacific region has seen the fastest growing growth in terms of value added for the six ocean-based industries. But mind you, it has been largely driven by China. Now, most of the added value from these ocean economies are captured by high-income countries, as you see here. But it is also for low income and lower middle income countries that represents the highest share of GDP. So on average, these countries, they are 11% uh, of these uh, ocean economy industries, whereas it's only 2% for high income countries, showing that these countries obviously are more reliant on these sectors for the economy and also more vulnerable to the growing anthropogenic pressures on the ocean. Now, and also to just to mention that the relative importance of the different ocean sectors, economic sectors, are very different across countries. So for low income and lower middle income countries, marine fisheries account for the bulk of their ocean economy compared to shipping in the OECD countries. Now, as the minister has been saying, Indonesia, but also many other developing countries are home to vast untapped marine resources but it's critical that they are in a position to access and balance the risk and rewards associated with using these resources. And I think these have been quite clearly described by the prior panel. It was very, very interesting to listen to. And that they are developed sustainable models for using and conversing these resources. If I could have the next slide kindly. Now, when we look at Indonesia, uh, our uh, recent country diagnostics of the sustainable ocean economy that the minister also referred to indicates that Indonesia's ocean economy has tripled in a very, very short period of time. And uh, it is very, very significant to the uh, gross uh, domestic product. And some it's being estimated up to 28%. Now, the OECD estimates on the six ocean-based industries shows that Indonesia has the largest ocean economy across the Asian countries. And you see this depicted on the left uh, table there, producing 67% of the total value added from these industries across Asian members in 2015. And then what you see on the right-hand side is that compared to other countries in the region, Indonesia has also a different composition of its ocean economy, relying on fishery sectors to a greater extent. It's 83% uh, of its ocean economy uh, and only 31% in East Asia Pacific region and on shipbuilding to a smaller uh, extent. And as the minister has said, uh, obviously this uh, uh, ocean economy has contributed largely to the country's strong economic record that we have seen uh, since the financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis. But obviously, looking also uh, at the current situation with the COVID-19 crisis, which uh, hit, has uh, hit Indonesia hard, including also its ocean economy sectors. And uh, uh, we, we have to see whether that uh, is a sustainable threat to the world the development gains that we have uh, seen and uh, appreciated so much. I could have the next slide, please. Now, um, referring to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, what we see from the figures is that the ocean-based sectors have been severely affected uh, by the crisis. Uh, we have estimated that in 2020 alone, international tourism dropped by 80% due to the pandemic, and that the fall in international tourism receipts, for example, in the first half of 2020 alone, is estimated to have been 460 billion US dollars more than three times the loss during the global financial crisis of 28-29. to 
Now, obviously, we are not sure what the precise impacts of these directions, disruptions are, um, but we believe that the crisis really casts growing uncertainties on the global ocean economy. And for some sectors, it may take years before the pre-COVID levels um, are reached again. But we also know that the demands on marine resources, on food, on energy, on minerals, on leisure, and all other needs of a growing global population will likely uh, increase. And that is why it is so critical that we turn the COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity for a blue recovery through coordinated and adequate international support. And the minister, Ibovini, just laid out the plans of, of her government. Now, protracted unsustainable use of ocean resources, as we know, and as we just heard, will strengthen and raise the ocean pollution and the anthropogenetic pressures that we already see negatively affecting many sectors. And we are afraid that obviously this is pushing the oceans uh, to its limits. Conversely, on the other hand, if the recovery is investing sustainably in ocean related sectors, um, this economy can provide clean, renewable energy, enhance society's resilience to climate and coastal shocks, provide food and livelihoods to billions. It can unlock new sustainable economic opportunities for a more diversified and resilient economy, fostering significant linkages and multiplier effects across sectors. Now, we therefore need a blue recovery that can both enhance long-term sustainability of, uh, of existing ocean economy sectors and generate new sustainable opportunities that can lead to greater economic diversification and act as a SDG multiplier across multiple economic and social areas. If I could have the next slide. Now, let me conclude just by saying a few words about the work that we are doing on sustainable ocean. Uh, in 2019, we launched the Sustainable Ocean for All initiative. It is having a focus on developing countries and the initiative brings together unique expertise and statistical resources from across the OECD. Now on this slide, you see the current priorities of this work, tracking development finance, country level evidence and support, including the blue recovery hubs, mobilizing private finance, and then obviously also cooperation. But uh, let me just uh, highlight one or two priorities here that as part of the country level evidence support depicted here, as the minister has referred to, we earlier this year have produced the Sustainable Ocean Economic Country Diagnostics of Indonesia, which is part of a series of comprehensive studies looking at the ocean economy holistically across sectors and focusing on the economic trends of the ocean economy, as well as the policy instruments and the funding mechanisms that can be used to grow these industries sustainably. Um, I'm delighted to have seen that the uh, that you, Ibu uh, Wini, referred to the study in your, your slides. I would like to wholeheartedly thank your team for the support to, uh, to helping uh, this study to come uh, into being. Now, we at the OECD look forward to continuing to contribute to the ambition of Indonesia towards fostering a sustainable ocean economy. And as you refer to Minister, uh, we would like and we are delighted to contribute to the Blue Economy Master Plan to be launched, as you refer to, at a G20 event under your presidency and in collaboration uh, with Sweden. And let me just conclude by saying and making also reference to the Blue Recovery Hubs. That's an initiative, a collaboration with the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action. And basically, these Blue Recovery Hubs aim to support countries at the country level to develop sustainable blue recovery plans and hope mobilize additional resources, but then also at the global level, basically foster peer learning across countries, as well as be a space for dialogue and cross fertilization across various actors, countries and experts. And uh, with uh, Fiji being the first uh, country uh, that where a blue recovery hub has been established, um, obviously we'll be delighted to explore opportunities maybe to have also such a blue recovery uh, hub being established uh, in Indonesia with the support of Sweden. And with that, Ambassador, back to you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Mr. Schütte, and thank you again, Ibu Winni, for thank you to both of you for sharing your insights and perspectives on the blue economy development. We are indeed looking forward to continue this journey together with both OECD and uh, with BAPNAS. So, we will soon be back for a further discussion now on how to develop the Swedish support to the roadmap for Indonesia's blue economy. So we'll take a very short break and see you soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, friends. 
Our panel discussion on Indonesia's blue economy development will be led by Ibu Stefani Yuvana. Stefani is co-founder and director of international engagement and policy reform at IOGI, the Indonesian Ocean Justice Initiative. Stephanie was previously special advisor to the Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries at the Presidential Task Force to combat illegal fishing. Now, through her advocacy work at IOGI, she is supporting the government of Indonesia by providing evidence-based policy advice on ocean governance. Ibu, the word is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Ambassador. Good afternoon, Jakarta time and good morning, Sweden time. I am Stephanie Juana, and I will be moderating the first panel today. So as a large ocean nation with over 270 million of population, blue economy is the only way for Indonesia. Blessed with very vast ocean that is rich in blue resources, Indonesia's ocean can yield a very substantial economic value of benefits for the people if properly and sustainably managed. The ocean provides a wide ranging values. In the main plenary earlier today, we learned about how the ocean helps Indonesia by making significant contribution in food security, job creation, nutritional needs, poverty eradication, improvement of livelihoods and the nation's economic growth in general. But at the same time, our face is also facing some problems. Climate change impacts, over-exploitation of resources, destruction of habitats and ocean pollution altogether compound stresses on the ocean health. And these problems will hinder ocean sustainability. Therefore, innovative solutions are needed to balance the economic use of the ocean and the efforts to maintain a long-term resilience and health of the ocean ecosystem. And this is what the Blue Economy concept is all about. Blue Economy aims to encourage sustainable use of the ocean resources for economic growth, improve livelihoods and jobs while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. And we have five panelists joining us for this panel. But before we get into the discussion, I will make a brief introduction of each panelist. The first one is Bapak Hendra Yusran Siri. Bapak Hendra is the Secretary of Director General of Marine Spatial Management at Indonesia's Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. And prior to his current position, Dr. Hendra assumed several leadership roles in the ministry. He was responsible in developing strategic inputs, providing policy coordination and technical support, and overseeing partnership management and resource mobilization. He was also responsible for programs in coastal disaster mitigation and climate change adaptation. Hello, Pahendra. Hello, Bo Stefani. Thank you. Thank you for the short introduction. Thank you very much. Very good afternoon. And our second panelist, Bapak Franz Teguh. Dr. Franz Tegu is the expert staff of the Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy. He started his career at the Department of Tourism, Post and Telecommunications in 1992. And since 2020, he was entrusted as the expert staff of the Minister for Sustainable Development and Conservation. Hello, Pak Franz. Uh, hello, Ibu uh, Stefani. Good morning, friends in Sweden, Swedish. And good afternoon for our friends in Indonesia. Hello. And our third panelist is Professor Dietrich Geoffrey Bangen. Professor Bangen is a professor at the Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science at Institut Pertanian Bogor, or IPB, since 1980. He was also serves as the head of Marine Hydrobiology Division at the Department of Marine Science and Technology and chairman of the Senate at IPB. With more than 40 years professional experience, Professor Bangen has tremendous experience in issues around marine sciences, which includes the development of planning of several marine and fisheries facilities. Hello, Professor Dietrich. Hello, Stefani. Good afternoon for all of us. Thank you for your introduction. And our fourth panelist is Mr. Matthias Gustafsson, Mr. Gustafsson works at IVL Swedish Environmental Research Institute. 
International Department with Project on Circular Economy, Waste, Sustainable Energy, and Transport. He has more than 20 years of experience with international work involving sustainability assessment, strategic planning, training, and outreach. Hello, Mr. Gustafsson. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning to all. Thank you for having me here. I'm very honored. Thank you. And last but not least, our fifth panelist is Mr. Matthias Rus. Mr. Rus is the head of section for Maritime at the Ministry of Infrastructure in Sweden. His experience includes national, EU, as well as global governance and policy development. He combines a strong foundation of environment and sustainability with respect and knowledge about market conditions, challenges, and opportunities for maritime businesses and blue sectors. Hello, Mr. Roos. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, good morning to you all in Sweden and good afternoon to the rest of you in Indonesia. I'm very happy to be here. Now we have all the speakers and I will start with Pahendra Yusran Siri from the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries with the first question. Pahendra, what are the government's priorities in the context of sustainable management of marine resources? Pahendra, you will have three minutes to answer the question and the screen is yours. Pat. All right, thank you. Um, Bani, I think it's just very uh, challenging questions, uh, but I would like to try to make sure. That first, I think as um, our ministers already mentioned a couple of uh, times that um, uh, we need to uh, integrate it uh, uh, in terms of the how to make it the ecosystem and ecology will be will be uh, uh, pre, you know will be the benefit of both of uh, uh, ecosystem and ecology. So uh, in terms of that, we need to um, ensure that. Um, uh, the many resources will be still uh, uh, served as a as a provider for the environmental services in uh, provisioning, regulating, and supporting uh, cultural aspect and support in national development. So this is one of the first um, uh, the government priority. And the second thing is about the promoting sustainable marine based economy from the existing industries such as uh, fisheries, tourism, transportation to the new emerging industry such as maricultures, energy from ocean and deep sea exploration and use. I think uh, as we uh, learned from Bu Amalia, as already mentioned, that we try to make sure that uh, the blue uh, ocean or the blue economy sector will be uh, to generate uh, more income for, for Indonesia. And of course, uh, uh, the last but not least, uh, increasing the community and state prosperity from the sustainable ocean economic activities. I think this is what uh, we uh, uh, prioritize that. I would like to inform that we are also part of the high level panel. Uh, sustainable ocean economy. I think uh, you know better than me, Bu, uh, Stephanie. Um, but uh, we would like to mention that this is already a uh, transformation document, which is Indonesia in the position to ensure that how the ocean will be still benefit for for the country and also for the uh, for the economic uh, in the point of view. I think this is a, a short uh, answer for your, your question, Bu, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pahendra. We will have more questions for you. Right after the next question, we are still continuing the discussion about national policies. And the next question will be for Pat Franz de Gouf from the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy. Pat Franz, so what is the government's plan to position Indonesia as one of the top destinations for marine ecotourism? And where are the top locations that the government will promote? Yeah. Uh, definitely, it is in line with the blue economy and also the approach for the marine ecotourism destination in Indonesia. So as a matter of fact, it is really indeed that it's connected with our resources that we have uh, so, yeah, across Indonesia. And we, we, really, we really touch uh, with the platform of the community-based sustainable tourism development as well as the approach is in the fundamental uh, on the ecosystem tourism-based management. I think that is very important to under, underline. And the second one is how, uh, how then uh, the government promoting the quality, inclusive, and sustainable tourism. So it means that we're prioritizing the holistic experience by maintaining uh, the quality of the source, sustainable management, economic uh, sustainability, 
as well as socio-cultural sustainability. And then last but not least is about the environmental sustainability. So uh, we, we have already uh, stipulated uh, some best or priorities uh, destination across the country. We have, uh, we have now uh, working with the uh, five uh, priorities destination and also uh, 10 priorities destinations such as, uh, you, you may see on the, my background, this is uh, in Labon Bajo, for example, and also in Likupang uh, as well. And in Lombok, it's also really uh, linked with the uh, eco-marine uh, uh, tourism uh, destination. And uh, another, another commitment that we have already done is uh, how then we, we stipulated the ministerial decree on the sustainable tourism destination, including marine ecotourism and archipelago to ensure the platform of the management as well as the community environment sustainability. So again, uh, we approaching with the uh, uh, capacity, uh, with the uh, caring capacity, environmental uh, impact assessment as well, and also the level of acceptable, acceptable change. And the cross sector cooperation and collaboration is really a key. So that's why we are very really encouraging uh, our friends from the Ministry of Fisheries and Maritime and also cross sectors to, to deal with the uh, collective effort uh, to have uh, the best uh, tourism destination with the marine ecotourism in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, Pak Franz. Now let's hear from the academia point of view. Professor Dietzikir Fribangen, Pak Jangan, based on your view, what are the general challenges in Indonesia in implementing blue economy? Thank you, Stephanie. I think it is undeniable that as the largest archipelagic country globally, Indonesia that has more than 16,000 island named, consisting of more than 15,000 uninhabited island. And uh, sure that we have more than 90% uh, being small island. The largest is 2,000 kilometers squared with a coastline of about uh, 104,000 kilometers and a sea area of 5.8 million kilometers squared or about 60, 70% of the territory. It's normal that Indonesia has enormous potential for marine living resources that can drive a sustainable fisheries based ocean economy. So coastal waters that surround small islands spread over the breadth of the sea with the, at least two highly productive ecosystems, namely coral reefs ecosystem, which represent about 80% of the world's coral reefs and mangrove ecosystems, which represent about 23% of the world's mangrove, are the providers of around 80% of the commercially important fish resources. Unfortunately, such great potential has not been fully optimized due to various challenges and limitation of infrastructure and facilities. Also, it is pretty common to use various fish resources that are not environmentally friendly, illegal, unreported, and unregulated. Therefore, to optimize the potential of such enormous fish resources based on blue economy, I think first, it is necessary to optimize 11 fisheries management areas that we call it WPP or WWPP based on small island and conservation. Secondly, to utilize innovative and value-added fish resources. And thirdly, to empower communities and stakeholders in fish resources utilization based on integrated partnership. I think this is my brief uh, answer to your question. Thank you, Mrs. Stefani. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dietrich. Uh, I have some follow-up questions, but now I will turn the screen over to our Swedish speakers. Um, the question will be, could you explain about your organization and its experience in supporting the development of blue economy? And also, 
do you see any potential partnership with Indonesia? We'll go to you first, Mr. Matthias Gustafsson from IVL. Thank you very much. Uh, I work at a research institute which was initiated 1966 already. And we, we have had an environmental focus already from the start. It's a not-for-profit uh, institute, uh, publicly owned to a great extent. And I would like to have two different uh, ways of, of closing in on this. First, first, more proactive on building and creating a stronger blue economy, uh, where we have a lot of collaboration with entrepreneurs, academia, private sector and civil society to to work together and uh, create new initiatives on um, aquaculture, on renewable energy, on maritime transports, on innovations, etc. And one rather good example of this is the Christina Bay Marine Research and Innovation Center, which is a corporation with uh, several different institutions, uh, and um, where IDL is one part. Uh, and uh, this this way is is like an incubator and a, a place where new innovations is, is created and cooperation is done. The second part uh, where we work with blue economy is really very much linked to what was discussed in an earlier session here, where a facilitation of blue economy is really about ensuring also that you have strong ecosystem services uh, at the sea uh, and marine uh, places, because if you don't have it, the, the blue economy and the foundation for blue economy is much reduced. So we work quite intensively on waste management, um, uh, sewage treatment, uh, trying to understand and prevent microplastic release, um, and so on and so forth. The source to see perspective was discussed earlier, and I think this is a good example of something that we also uh, work and uh, we have had a uh, cooperation with Indonesia for for some years actually especially in the waste management sector to try to avoid waste to sort of go into the the waterways or and then end up in in the mine areas so there's definitely plenty of things to do. We also work with strategies and policies on how to create them and about this with cooperation with private sector, with different uh, organizations in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gustafsson. And also we're gonna turn the screen over to Mr. Roos. Similar question, could you share with us about the experiences of the Ministry of Infrastructure in supporting the development of the economy. Also, do you see any potential partnership with Indonesia? Thank you very much. It's a uh, it's a really pleasure to be uh, to be here today. I must say, um, uh, it's uh, I sort of applaud the initiative here. Now, I will tell a, a short story in very few as a few words I can to to sort of answer your question uh, because we have been developing in the blue economy sphere for for quite some time and um, it's a really a step by step um, um, learning process uh, I would say fifteen years ago the EU started to to, um, with the vision of blue growth, as it was called then. It was very early and immature in the process. It was more like a, a vision and a general understanding that we um, needed uh, an integrated perspective of, of the ocean. Uh, 10 years ago, we, um, we created in Sweden the, uh, the author about 10 years ago, the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Man Management, uh, Jakob Granit was just visiting you. Uh, and then we started to work with marine spatial planning, uh, which at that time was a, a brand new concept. Um, and as you heard from Jakob, we, we still not really ended that process uh, yet. It was sort of a starting point for all of us to start to think about this, to integrate uh, the, the policy making for the ocean. And MSP, marine spatial planning, 
doesn't automatically create sustainable activities, but it's an important tool uh, to plan whatever goal it is that you want to reach. And it makes it much more easier for the industry to, to foresee um, what is possible and what is not. Now, in 2015, we, we created the, um, the, marine, the, the Swedish Marine Strategy. Uh, it was actually a few weeks prior to the launch of the SDGs. And it was an exercise to understand our stakeholders, to get a better picture about what their, their needs and their contribution to society, as well as the conflicts within the stakeholders and the conflict with the environment. So, and, and it was also a way for the, for the government to sort of point at a direction and say, this is where we want to go. Because I, it's an important, it's very important to be as clear as possible to the industry where we want to go. Because the industry, they don't want to be sitting there with stranded assets. So they listen very carefully. And we need the industry to move together with us because they are the one with the innovation. They are the ones with the brand new ideas. So we need to work uh, together with uh, the industry. And within this strategy, uh, the maritime strategy, we have now 28 indicators with social, environmental and economic descriptors to help us track uh, the progress and get a, a fuller picture. Um, then, of course, 2017, we had the UN Ocean Conference, which Sweden hosted together with Fiji. Uh, and it was another stepping stone for all of us to sort of start to think about, to get out of our silos and think about the ocean as one. Lastly, uh, we have the EU, uh, which we are part of. And um, now the, very, the process has gone so far in the EU. So we have a proper working party called uh, Maritime Issues. And that working party only deals with these broad maritime questions. And it's a really slow process. And we are uh, 20, we are lots of member states that have slightly different views but since the ocean is, is one, we need to, to cooperate. And we are not, re we haven't reached our goal yet by far. So cooperation is vital within the EU, within regions, even larger or smaller, depending on what ocean we are talking, what part of the ocean we are talking about, and internationally. And I'm thrilled uh, by the process that uh, Indonesia have, have, have started, it, it seemed to be really well grounded. And as I've heard, and as I know before, Indonesia has such a important um, position uh, it, for, for ocean topics. It's such an important part of the world, oceans. So, so, so we are thrilled to see what how we could co cooperate further and what we can uh, what we can achieve together so thank you i'll i'll stop there for now yeah thank you very much mr Roos. and this is relating to your answer a follow up question to pat hendra but how important is bilateral regional and international cooperation for indonesia to implement blue economy uh, thank you, Bo Stephanie. I think it's, uh, it's really important, Bo Stephanie, because um, uh, as you know, that we cooperate the area that we have more than uh, 17,000 uh, 17, islands. Sorry, sorry. 17,000 islands, and also the, the long, our coastline is quite the second la longest in the world. And this is pretty important because uh, the complexity of the, the, uh, the, uh, the issue of the oceans needs. Uh, uh, hand in hand together as well. Uh, we live in the neighboring countries and then also what happens in Indonesia probably will happen to the other countries, the other wars. And I would like to uh, also highlight that um, Indonesia is a, a 
as the founders and also uh, active members for uh, for the Coral Triangle Initiative and Coral Reef Refrigeration Food Security. This is a home of the uh, the heart of the coral reef in the world because almost 75 percent of the coral reef uh, biodiversity can be found in that area. And uh, uh, we have also uh, the regional secretariat in Manado, Bu uh, Stepani, and also open for uh, discussion because this is the unique collaborations uh, that uh, uh, among the uh, six countries that uh, uh, comprise the Southeast Asian countries and also Pacific one. I think is uh, that is a uh, highly important. And I can add, add uh, more related for uh, cooperation. We have also Ayora, Bu Stefani, and this is also important how we see that the Indian Ocean is one of uh, our uh, connected uh, uh, connected uh, modalities for working together with other countries. And then also uh, with the presidency of Indonesia for the G20, I think this is uh, the opportunity to uh, strengthen the cooperation. The last uh, presidency by the Saudi Arabian, they, they focus on the coral reef. And I think uh, this is opportunity with the Sweden. We, I think we open and then we look forward to having more collaboration with Sweden, the implementation of the blue economy and also the marine, how to, uh, the marine spatial planning uh, works. Uh, I would like to mention that we, 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 we strengthen the, our marine uh, uh, spatial planning which is uh, the complexity probably a bit different with the Sweden uh, because uh, as I mentioned in the first uh, 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 my intervention that uh, we have more complexity uh, in terms of uh, resources, in terms of the cultures and then also the problem. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you very much, Pahendra. But Franz, same questions. How important is bilateral, regional, and international cooperation for Indonesia to implement blue economy, and particularly in the tourism sector? Yes, uh, in, uh, I think it's very, really, very really important to have a, a strong collaboration and cooperation because uh, for tourism nowadays and in the future, it's very, uh, very important to take into account uh, the the notion of the sustainability, preservation, and conservation. So I think uh, it's really important for Indonesia in in terms of how then we have an integrated uh, marine ecotourism development. So that this really a, a kind of uh, approach that we are we are working so far, and then uh, the strategic uh, innovation and collaboration with the science based approach because it's it's really uh, it's really uh, connected with the uh, values of the experience and then we can transform into value for money. So I think this is, this is really a kind of uh, opportunity for us to, to have a more and more uh, holistic experience and then we can uh, produce uh, the product diversification that really connect with the environmental sustainability. So I think in this case, uh, the capacity building for the destination management, including capacity building for the community is very important. And then uh, how, how can we go so far with the carrying capacity, uh, limit of acceptable taste, and also monitoring for the impact, uh, for the environmental impact assessment on the marine and archipelago. So, so I think this is this is really a, a great challenge for us, and we really hope that uh, with the cooperation with the Sweden uh, government and stakeholders, so we can have uh, a vision to, uh, together to reach uh, Indonesia can be a sustainable tourism hub for uh, Asia Pacific and also for the global platform. Thank you for the answer, Pa Franz. Now we get back to you, Pa Dietrich. So the question for you is, from your perspective, what do you think are the key important factors to be considered in developing sustainable blue economy? And do you see multi-stakeholders involvement as a key element? You are still in mute, Pa. So answer to your question that uh, we know that now Indonesia various efforts has been are being and 
will be made by the government yeah? by structuring and optimizing marine fisheries management, especially for capture fisheries, marine culture, and marine tourism based on the potential and also advantages of each region based on their suitability and carrying capacity. So this is the, the base of the program that uh, the government try to, to extend yeah, for uh, optimizing the, the, the marine fisheries sustainably. For example, it has been uh, developed also in several locations of integrated marine and fisheries centers, especially those based on small island. And in addition that in this case, the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries has launched three main programs for capture fisheries and marine culture, miserably and sustainably based on the blue economy. I think uh, this is the big change uh, from uh, the program uh, before that actually we hope that all the stakeholders can, can collaborate together to, to extend uh, the possibility to use uh, marine fisheries sustainably based on the blue economy. This is the, my answer for that. Yeah, thank you, Pak Dietrich. Um, Pak Matthias, Pak Matthias Gustafsson and also Pak Matthias Rus. We have a question from the audience in YouTube. So the question is, monitoring and evaluation appear weak in Indonesia, particularly in marine pollution cases and learning from the experience in Sweden, how does the Swedish government enforce the rules and what are the consequences for the society? We'll start with you, Mr. Roos. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's a tough question if you regard to the, Marie, the blue economy as a whole. Uh, because I think uh, lots, I was talking about indicators, which we have to try to look at the whole, but when we go to, to monitoring, um, then I think we're still a little bit siloed up. Uh, so, I mean, fishery is, is a specific kind of monitoring, environment is here, uh, some shipping and ports uh, is, is here. Um, so, so from a from a if you want to talk integrated blue economy, I think uh, I think we still have a long way to go, um, because when you're trying to reach out for, I mean, when you try to develop the way you you handle your your resource or your blue economy, you. You have a lot of new policy and we have seen that if you don't enforce it uh, enough straight away the the sort of the good guys or those who actually follow the policy and they they see that those who doesn't follow it they get away with it probably cheaper and they get very upset and they come back to us and say hey <laughs> what is this uh, a good example or a bad example was when we enforced uh, new sulfur regulation for uh, for shipping in the Baltic Sea in 2015. Very good regulation. We really cut down on, on sulfur. Uh, but in the beginning, we didn't have um, proper monitoring and um, any kind of penalizing of those who didn't follow it. And of course, those who did got very upset with us. Now we have it, but it took a few years and uh, it wasn't the best exercise. Uh, obviously, we should have been there straight away. But for once, uh, a change came fast and policy didn't, we weren't able to, to catch up. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, that's not good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the answer, Mr. Roos. Now we'll hear from Mr. Gustafsson. Any few on this, Pat? No, uh, I, I can just second what my what the other Matthias was saying that uh, that that there is obviously a lot of levels here also that we are working both on on local levels and national level and then of course the the regional level where where you have uh, cooperation between different countries and of course it needs to be 
uh, regulations and actions that are accepted for for the changes in order for it to be to be realized. Uh, then, of course, uh, policy making and strategies are very important to to drive and, and create these uh, situations. But you can also have um, private sector to to understand that this is such an important thing for it to be able to continue. Because if if our environment is 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 uh, ruined, we will obviously have less opportunity to to make these opportunities realize that we that we have in the blue economy that, and 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 it's really very clear that we need to cooperate between countries between different sectors and stakeholders it has been a lot of discussion about these silos and this this is where where a lot of the challenges lies and sweden have a long history of, of working together in this and, and my own research institute for example we're really trying to involve different stakeholders in the uh, activities uh, both private public academia and of course also civil society we shouldn't forget people uh, those who are actually living in in the society so to speak thank you yeah thank you very much for the answer pa gustafson um, another question. This is for Pa Franz Tegu. Pa Franz Tegu, as an Indonesian young generation, this is also a question from YouTube. As an Indonesian young generation, I'm very curious is there is anything that we could do to participate or contribute in the blue economy from now? Yeah, up, uh, of course, and absolutely. So, uh young generation is a green is a leader for tomorrow so i think uh, we really uh hope and expect uh, the involvement the engagement of the uh, of the young generation to be a green leader a sustainable leader for the future so you are you are you are young today but you will be the leader for tomorrow i think that that's a very important notion for for you the guys here yeah. Uh, the the youngs and I, I think uh, there's a lot a range of activities to be uh, to be participated into the sustainable blue economy and also marine and eco uh, destination. For example, we are now uh, working with the uh, waste management, and I think this is really big big challenge for us yeah? waste management. And now we we are thinking of and also prototyping the uh, carbon footprint calculator for the visitors. So it means that uh, we can deal with the offsetting activities on the ground and then uh, how then we can deal with the coral adoption, something like that. So I think this is a range of uh, uh, a mode of participation that we can uh, go so far because uh, in terms of the tourism activities, uh, for for marine services and also uh, archipelago, uh, we we can have uh, like uh, fishing, surfing, diving, cruising, yachting. So that there's a range, and it's really really uh, a big opportunity for us. So I think I I, I encourage uh, uh, all of us uh, to be to be engaged in the sustainable and inclusive and more quality uh, tourism for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Franz. Now a question for Pa Hendra. Pa Hendra, we all know that we are facing a COVID-19 pandemic at the moment, and it has affected many sectors, including the marine sector. So do you see developing blue economy can happen during this pandemic, or do you have a sense that we are losing the urgency because the focus is only around the pandemic rather than the opportunity to develop the economy. Uh, thank you, Stefani. I think um, I can give one example that what we happened to us, how the uh, COVID-19 response uh, effort hand in hand together with the uh, uh, you know the blue economy activities so when uh, you know bali for example this is depends really depends on the tourism so when the covid 19 is a limit us to travel and also to enjoy the 
uh, sightseeing and so on. Uh, the Bali is uh, get uh, uh, minus uh, the get minus uh, uh, economic growth. So uh, what we uh, conducted is like we try to you know this is a, a good times uh, for us to recovery and also that's why uh, uh, because the 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 stress is really uh, reduced. So what we try to uh, make sure that by have uh, planting the uh, the coral reef. So we mobilize uh, more than uh, eleven thousand. Uh, uh, worker uh, that's uh, already impacted by uh, by the COVID-19 because uh, lose of uh, uh, the revenue. So uh, we we mobilized that and we also uh, uh, touch the five areas in Bali and then and then uh, good good uh, put put the coral reef uh, replantation. And so after uh, three months or five months of monitoring evolution, and we we see that this is a good uh, you know uh, give the some. A good promising. So for me, it's, it's not like uh, lose the momentum, but I think how we deal with the momentum is really important. And you can see that also um, uh, we just uh, export about uh, 40 ton of uh, our uh, fresh fish to the US because the increased demands right now. So um, uh, we still optimistic. And then I, I'm sure that uh, marine and fisheries is one of uh, the sectors that still growth in positive ways, uh, even in during uh, COVID-19. And uh, of course, uh, Stephanie, if you see that COVID, uh, COVID you, you know, uh, when we COVID, the good vitamin for uh, the COVID is uh, vitamin C, uh, sex, sexing, or uh, we, we enjoy the C, that's a vitamin C. That's really important for us. And then also fish. Uh, today is um, the national uh, uh, eat fish uh, movement. So I encourage that uh, eat a lot of fish, especially from Indonesia, you will get, get good health and also, you know, the good, uh, uh, a good uh, defender for, for the COVID-19. I'm sure that, and then also please enjoy the sea because this is really vitamins that you enjoy your, your, your body and also your mind. So it's really important to go to the uh, Bali, to go to uh, any, anywhere in the Indonesia. So please enjoy that. Thank you. I encourage Pak Francis as well. So Pak Francis might be should be agree with me. You know, go to the Labuan Bajo, go to Bali, go to Raja Ampat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Pak Hendra. It, it really makes me want to go diving right now. So for all speakers, thank you very much for being very mindful of the time. We have very insightful remarks in this panel. And from the speakers, we heard about some important elements in implementing blue economy, which includes sound and clear planning, cross-sector collaboration, stakeholders participation, environmental assessment, monitoring and evaluation, and also implementing blue economy. Although we've seen some big opportunities here in Indonesia, but well, it is still a challenging work. So that is why we could use some help from other countries we can learn from the Sweden experience and also we can also use some help from private sectors as well. So thank you very much for all the speakers joining us today and thank you for all the audience joining in YouTube. I will now return the screen over back to the main panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we should be able to join, uh, to enjoy uh, the ocean, all of us. And definitely climate change is for real and no longer uh, a distance problem for future generation. The positive thing is though that we can do something about it. If we work together between countries and between actors, government, private sector and academia, Let's make sure that we take this opportunity post-pandemic to, to rebuild better and bluer. Thank you, Ibu Giovanna, for your excellent moderating and, and thank you to all panelist members for sharing insights and perspectives. So valuable, thank you very much. We will now take a short break and then very short break and then come back to discuss how the private sector can engage and support the blue economy and the blue economy development.
Welcome back. Our next topic of discussion is to examine how the private sector can support the blue economy development of Indonesia. For this purpose, we have selected a group of Swedish companies that are eager to engage and have solutions for the blue economy. We will now play a video to introduce them. Seventy-one percent of our planet's surface is covered with water. The ocean has so much yet to offer. Using what we've learned from the past, we can now produce truly sustainable energy. At Hexagon, sustainability is at the core of all our decisions. We developed the Twin Wind System, a floating solution that enables wind farms to be positioned further offshore and in deeper waters than conventional designs, where they have less visual and environmental impact and better wind conditions. The Twin Wind System is designed to allow the platforms to align with the direction of the wind, maximizing efficiency. The Twin Turbine design allows the deployment of more turbines per sea area, increasing the energy yield per acreage by 45%. Hexagon, bringing sustainable floating wind farms to the world. Everywhere you turn, things are turning around you. Spinning, rotating. Take a look. Imagine how many billions of rotating machines are at work. In factories and homes, on the roads, in the fields and in the air. Our job is knowing those machines inside and out, ensuring they rotate reliably. Even though each industry has different needs, each customer its unique demands, one common denominator is always the demand for lightweight products that produce less friction. Minimizing friction is what we've done for more than a century and what we'll continue to do. It all began with a robust bearing design that design was born from a dedication to research and development across all industries. R&D isn't just about product development. By testing new technologies in our own factories, we can take what we've learned and put it into practice out in the field. The Industry 4.0 revolution has already begun at SKF. Digitalization in our factories is improving efficiency and performance making processes smarter. The bearings themselves are becoming increasingly smarter. By monitoring vibration, load, temperature and speed of bearings, we can tell a lot about the condition of rotating machinery. New technology can now even provide that data instantly, which means maintenance can be planned and problems fixed before breakdowns occur. And that adds up to more uptime, a must in any competitive industry. Analytics are critical to those who perform the maintenance on the machines and design the products inside. It's key to collaborate with customers in the design process to make improvements for their specific needs. If there was just a little less friction and less weight in all we designed and built, imagine the possibilities. We are truly everywhere. And that's never going to change because everything around us we keep turning, spinning, rotating. We are creating a world of reliable rotation. So our crusade against friction and weight continues. That work will never be done. Will never be done. Will never be done. It's a never ending story.
The discussions on the role of private sector to support the development of blue economy in Indonesia will be led by Ibu Vivik Madayani, founder and director at Desma Center. Since its establishment in 2010, Desma Center continues to encourage and involve the government, private sector, communities, associations and other stakeholders in facilitating the development of sustainable tourism destinations. So Ibu, you have the word. Thank you very much indeed, Bapak Eric, for uh, the kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted and honored to moderate such important panel with uh, distinguished speakers today. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, depending on where you are. I hope you stay safe and healthy. Welcome to the panel discussion too, where uh, we are going to discuss uh, the role of the private sectors to the blue economy in Indonesia. And uh, the blue economy provides uh, economic potential for uh, recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, economic transformation for inclusive and sustainable development. And uh, the development is based on the economic value of marine resources that creates added value in the supply chains. And uh, the goal is to accelerate economic growth, to improve people welfare and uh, contribute to the uh, environmental sustainability. As Indonesia has vast potentiality, then uh, we need to identify the concept and to recognize concrete action through possible collaboration. And uh, as the key point is innovation, inclusive and sustainable, then we need to learn, uh, especially from the Swedish side, the implementation of blue economic projects and uh, what the private sector role can play in supporting the government in the implementation of uh, blue economy. We have our distinguished panelists uh, together with us today. Uh, we have both uh, Indonesia and uh, Sweden side. We have Ibu Shana Fatina, she's entrepreneur and the president director of the Labuan Bajo Tourism Authority under the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy. BPO LBE act, act as an accelerator of uh, tourism development through uh, coordinating and authoritative functions in the Labuan Bajo area and 10 other agencies on the mainland of Flores. We also have Bapak Lars of Vanilit, Business Development Executive at Hexicon AV with 40 years experience, have a wide experience leading and developing business uh, to selling system solutions in uh, multiple industries. He now engaged in projects regarding renewable energy, focusing on solar and floating wine. Um, we also have Ibu Christina Lundbeck, uh, founder and chairman of uh, the board of Surf Cleaner, AV, and head of corporate relations. Ibu Christina has a master of uh, science uh, degree and have extensive experience in uh, business development and sales uh, for growth in both uh, large companies and smaller firms in startup stage. Ibu Christina is also a member of board in Cascade Drives and uh, Core Power Ocean. And we also have Baba Budi Wibowo, Chairman at Indonesian Fishery Products Processing and Marketing Association, AP5I. AP5I is a forum for uh, entrepreneurs and professional associations in the field of processing, production, and marketing of uh, fishery products. We also have Baba uh, Martin Bjork, Founder and Chairman of uh, EcoBart Sweden. Uh, Bapa uh, Martin Björk is a hands-on entrepreneur with personal experience from starting and developing business, agency network, uh, license offices, a joint ventures, startups, uh, procurements, productions in over 40 countries with uh, marine industry, renewables, and uh, clean technology. And uh, we also have uh, Bapa Shaiful Kotaha Tuhaha. Uh, heavy uh, industry segment manager at SKF Indonesia. SKF Marine is a global family with more than 70 years experience in the maritime industry that support uh, ship owner, uh, ship operators and uh, shipyards 
in boosting uh, the productivity and uh, reducing uh, operating costs. Excellency, directors, heads, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, further ado, um, let me uh, start our discussion today uh, by asking directly uh, Ibu uh, Shana Patina. Okay, uh, Ibu Shana Patina, uh, as we know that Labuan Bajo is uh, one of uh, major projects in Indonesia, one of super priority destinations, uh, sustainable tourism and premium destinations. And uh, regarding this contact, uh, could you describe the plan uh, for uh, development of Labuan Bajo? Uh, what are the key indicators that uh, need to be achieved uh, to, be, uh, to position Labuan Bajo and other uh, agencies as pioneers uh, in terms of uh, ecotourism in Indonesia? Ibu. Thank you, uh, Ibu Uli. Uh, so as you can see, uh, well, Labuan Bajo Flores uh, Tourism Authority, we have uh, the authority to manage and coordinating through 11 agencies of the islands of Flores, Lembata, Alor, and two districts in Bima Regency as a part of the Komodo Sphere Research. So basically our vision is to bring Labuan Bajo to be the world-class, inclusive, sustainable tourism destination, and at the same time as the gate of uh, the exotic East Nusa Tenggara. So our place is uh, have the icon, which is the famous Komodo National Park, a UNESCO, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And our job is how to solve the SDGs challenge through tourism and creative economy development. Our quality tourism challenge is how to preserve the environment and tackle poverty issues in this East Nusa at the same time. So we create 300 degrees experience on tourism. We target quality tourists, we stay longer, spend more, but have awareness on preserving on the environment. Uh, we're not targeting the massive tourism, but more to the uh, special interest one. And we're planning to use like renewable energy for Flores and hopefully it can be adopted for the entity area. Most important is the local culture and the people and how they can participate in the momentum because uh, we know that it's a capacity building that needs to be done. And therefore we build the opportunities and ecosystem through trainings, entrepreneurial incubators and produce local products. For Labuan Bajo itself, actually, uh, our key indicators mainly focus on three critical success factors. The first one is the managing the carrying capacity, especially for the Komodo National Park, how to manage the marine protection area and support the community development, sustainable fishing, manage balance on supply for tourism, and et cetera. And also, the second one is to improve the accessibility by a direct international flight to Labuan Bajo itself. And then, as a gate of the NTT, uh, we are hoping that uh, by opening Labuan Bajo, it can drive the economy and the tourism sector in the East Nusa Tenggara. And the third one is how to design an implementation of the integrated tourism master plan that preserves the ecology and the biodiversity by supporting local culture and people development and give sustained prosperity for all. So this ITMP will able to guide us for the next 25 years on development. And that is the key points about what is the issue needs to be done and to be protected uh, in developing Labuan Bajo Flores uh, destination. Thank you very much, Ibu, for uh, sharing your thought and um, your opinion on this. Um, it's really provide um, the definition of what is uh, the context of sustainable tourism and a premium uh, tourism destination. Then we move to uh, Ibu uh, Christina and Bapak Lars. Uh, we have seen the videos uh, before earlier, and um, I think it would be interesting for us to know more about uh, your company and uh, its experience in uh, ocean uh, economy sector. Uh, could you please explain more on that? Ibu Christina first. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what SURF really does is that we can collect, separate, and also discharge surface pollution in the same machine. So we can make it really, our vision is to make a positive, direct, and sustainable impact on the environment. And we need to, handle all the industry because what we can do is take care of diesel oil floating sludge and yeah pollution on the water surface so we need to make an impact into the industry for one 
to take care of the surface pollution before it ends up in the oceans or the rivers and things like that. So, and we can also yeah, help out in harbors and yeah, things like that. But uh, it's really important, I think, to, to get the industry to, to work together because yeah, without any clean water, we can't exist. And we have clear goals, uh, 2030 goals, that we should take care of our water to clean it. Now it's about 20% that you can sort of clean the used water, but you have to go up to 60%. And how are you going to do that? Then you need solutions that can take care of that pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Christina, for uh, the explanation. And uh, the same question goes to Bapak Lars. Uh, could you please uh, explain the experience in uh, ocean economy sector of your uh, company, Bapa? Yes, I can do that. Thank you for having me here. So, Hexacom is specialized in offshore wind, but we are not only a technology company, we also start every project with our own scoping. And what we've learned so far is that if you try to do things in serial, it will take you an enormous amount of time. But if you do things in parallel, it will go much, much faster. I can give you two examples. One is when we started our uh, enterprise in uh, South Korea. Um, we went there to an industrial fair. We met and later on hooked up with a partner from Collins. Collins knew exactly all the route to the uh, decision makers. We then formed the joint venture. We had a presentation. I was also present in Korea on a wind, offshore wind um, exhibition. And after that one, we were invited to a new uh, region to present our ideas. And after that, we had um, a set aside a water area where we are now together with our joint venture partner and also with Shell constructing the world's biggest uh, offshore wind farm. So they knew what to do. We were awarded a feasibility study, a lead study, and we were then awarded the first water area. We now have five water areas in Korea. In Sweden, which is the totally opposite, uh, there were no rules uh, if you wanted to go out in the economical zone. So I did a full scale study on actually who would be the stakeholder. Uh, I also spoke to this Christian Advice Center and the municipalities around the West and East Coast, the fisheries, and try to map out who would be the beneficiary and who would be the one who had a challenge with what we were planning to do in Sweden. That ended up with uh, the word coexistence and also that we just start the business development project. And this is exactly what we intend to do. And this is also what we did in uh, South Korea. So for South Korea, it was a, really a development project because they were lacking on or uh, diminishing their uh, shipyard industry. So from my perspective, we need to do it uh, simultaneously. Uh, we need to decide if you really want to have offshore wind. And if you want to have that, uh, we can support you with the stage from how to do it and then up till uh, decision making, how it should look like. And we have now three projects going on. One where we set up our first uh, demo project up in Norway. The second one will be in uh, England, UK, in Cornwall. The first one to deliver the electricity. And the third one will be in Spain, where we actually use the windmills in order to produce electricity to hydrogen production. So I believe we can support you in every reason you would like to do this. And as we are far out at sea, this will be much easier to coexist with the fisheries, the municipalities, the local stakeholders, and really support you with the electricity, green, really green electricity. Thank you very much, Baba Lars, for um, your explanation and study cases that uh, you bring uh, to the table. Then uh, we also need to move forward to Baba Budi Wibowo. Uh, Baba Budi, uh, regarding um, 
the field of processing, uh, production, and um, marketing of fishery products that your association undertake. Could you please uh, elaborate on the general condition of uh, Indonesia fisheries sector and um, how sustainable fisheries uh, can contribute uh, to Indonesia's uh, blue economy? Uh, thanks, Ms. Vivi. Uh, please allow me to speak in Indonesia language. Export of fisheries from Indonesia in 2020 it has a total of 5.2 billion US dollars with the main product of, of prawns of 40%. And after that, the second one is tuna fish and then crack meat and other types of fish. The export destinations for Indonesia's fishery products are USA, around 40% of our exports, and then China, around 17%, and two other Asian ASEAN countries, 13% of our products, 12% to Japan, to uh, European Union, uh, around 12%, and other countries. The raw material for the fisheries industry uh, is sourced from two um, sources, from uh, fishing and uh, aquaculture. Uh, in time, the uh, material for fisheries products um, managed by the industry, uh, fishery industry is, comes more from cultivation of fish. And the international market has uh, uh, three requirements, good safety, sustainability, and traceability. Those three aspects are very closely related to the uh, concept of blue economy, especially in terms of sustainability aspect, because the, our main market is the uh, export market. So members of our association of the fisheries industry in Indonesia have to really understand the concept of blue economy. As entrepreneurs, of course, all of us would like to have long-term business dealings and we do uh, very, very understand so in order to be achieved that we cannot uh, degrade the uh, environment and exploit uh, uh, natural resources excessively. That would be my explanation. Thank you. Interesting uh, highlight from your side, so speaking on the export number uh, uh, from Indonesia uh, to the country of USA, China, ASEAN, uh, Japan, Japan, and uh, uh, in Europe, and uh, also uh, your confirmation on um, the need of uh, sustainability in, in terms of uh, the business. Uh, uh, mechanism and process. And uh, we're moving forward to uh, Bapak Martin Bjork and Bapak Shaiful. Uh, I think I'm interested to know uh, as uh, the global use cases of your technology in uh, providing a solution for a uh, blue economy. Uh, could you please share about it? And um, what is uh, the lesson learned for Indonesia, Bapak Martin? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I have been working with Indonesia as one of many countries since the 1990s. I was a prior of Pertamina and Peter Pal, and I also had the pressure of visiting Flores and Labuan Bajo several times. So uh, you can say that the cooperation between our governments within blue economy can really only become successful if based on the needs identified by Indonesian communities implemented in line with Indonesian business culture, and if commercially competitive, uh, the local community need to make more money on doing things right than wrong. So we need to be holistic and inclusive, and more actions, less words. Uh, Sweden is fantastic with innovations, as we can see also today, but we lack the uh, capacity for turnkey installations abroad. So you can say we may deliver the perfect drill, but Indonesia need financed holes based on local production of drilling machines, to make an example. So we have uh, created EcoBarge for covering the missing link in between. So the EcoBarge concept supports the blue economy, and the proven business model is based on meeting needs identified by local partners through mutual feasibility studies led by EcoBarge, 
and based on build own operate transfer mode of ownership to Indonesian entrepreneurs or the local communities, whether that will be within resource or fishing industries. And uh, this is in line with almost all the sustainability goals. So the EcoBosch concept incorporate technology transfer and localized production of modular barges designed by EcoBosch at local yards. This under EcoBarge supervision, commissioning and operation. Uh, so the solutions are scalable, focusing on providing all necessary for converting resource to eco resource for fishing villages uh, or for meeting the needs of entire cities. So functions can be added, capacity increased by adding modules. And the deployment time from finalized visibility to fully operational can be less than a year. So the uh, we also provide full project financing. So the competitive project financing is provided through ship financing, Swedish export credit and carbon emission trading. So operation maintenance and education is secured through service agreements whereby Ecobar chief engineers also act as teachers. The barges and their revenues represent the financial security and the concept provide investors unbeatable returns. In a just finalized uh, feasibility study financed by Swedish government, uh, we incorporated free uh, emission-free electricity, uh, desalinated water, cooling of fish, and the expected return for investors' full investment was less than 12 months and 25 years uh, economical lifetime. This was in the Zanzibar case, where 35% of the fish caught is lost due to lack of cooling, thereby causing overfishing. And as the borders can also be moved between end users, they represent a much better security than land-based installation. And it's now supposed to be developed for 300,000 people on Sansco uh, as in the second step. Uh, so with an eco barge, you can incorporate any type of technology and you don't need to use land. The floating solar power technology we use have already been tested in Philippines, another country within the ring of fire in Typhoon 4 conditions, meaning 275 kilometers per hour wind speed. And we can also incorporate floating wind, bioenergy, uh, waste to energy, energy storage, electrical grid frequency balancing, potable water, solid and food waste recovery, including plastic. Uh, and and uh, we can even install hospital rooms. Uh, Echo barges provide heating, cooling, cold storage, mobile connectivity, uh, docking and bunkering of ships, as well as we provide for sustainable fish farming, fish agricultural processing, and even organic farming. So you can think of Ecobosch as a modular ship finance marina that provide all the needs for a community regardless size. Uh, so we deliver turnkey and at the same time we localize whatever can be produced within Indonesia. We operate plants, we employ locally for providing the services and the pay and the, you can say the it's paid off through uh, paying less for uh, good emission free electricity, for instance, than for fossil fuel. Uh, now, for all these new technologies to become accepted, we need local pilot plants. Pilot plants. So, eco bodies can be used as educational platforms and continuously updated test beds for the latest sustainable technologies. So, this without interruption of services delivered in parallel. You only need to add a module. And currently, eco bodies is also evaluated by United Nations for supplying electricity and water off grid in crisis and catastrophe, uh, with an ongoing project financed by Swedish government. And this business model also provides Swedish innovation companies opportunities for organic growth and scaling without dilution of shareholding for financing product development. So we have identified more than 2000 Swedish companies and we work with Electricity in Stockholm where we create, you can say, events where these companies can pitch their solutions and compete for participating. Uh, and uh, EcoBot itself has all the necessary competence for dimensioning of systems, calculating wind, solar, etc., for visualizations, for evaluating technologies, and also to provide legally designed agreements what is necessary. And this business model reduces risk of copying of intellectual property as we are secured through shareholders' agreement, and also reduces risk of corruption. And the team behind has developed more than 1,000 installations in more than uh, 50 countries, including Indonesia, where we also have experience from owning and operating from the marine and offshore world. The main challenges we faced in, in uh, Indonesia is political red tape, bankability of end users, and lack of financing of the pre-feasibility studies, which are so crucial as they are the ones identifying the local opportunities. There is no lack of project financing if you can provide a business case that we can prove is solid. Then we have more money from project financers available than is required. And as return on investment is phenomenal, 
uh, I mean, the product financing is very easy, but both investors and end users need feasibilities to prove each business case before investing. So I hope that we today can form a task group involving interested Indonesian and Swedish stakeholders. Very happy to do the Lab One Baju. Uh, for these eco-bars opportunities within the Indonesian market in line with the blue economy. So uh, we hope that it is natural to include eco also in the master plan in Indonesia. So feel free to contact me if you want to participate in this uh, task force. We already have inquiries uh, in Indonesia for the concept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bapak Martin, for a uh, uh, very comprehensive uh, explanation. And uh, Bapak Shaiful. Uh, could you please also share about your technology in uh, providing solution for a uh, blue economy and also the lesson learned for Indonesia, Papa? Thank you very much, moderator. Um, invasive aquatic organism now threat, given a major threat to the marine ecosystems. And uh, maybe this is unfortunately the shipping or vessels is one of the pathways that. Um, introducing such a movement or such an exchange of organism from one location to another. So I International Maritime Organization in 2004 conventions adopted the regul some sets of standard of regulations, which is aims to prevent movement of organism from one region to another, which is may create the, the cat catastrophic or or uh, um, bad environmental. Such standard also adopted by our gov Indonesian government here with, with setting of some regulations deal with the uh, the um, marine ecosystem or, or oceans or seas um, um, environmental cleaning. What happened in our company was our marine family designed and developed, including manufacture, systems and methodology to comply with such standard which is regulated and adopted by IMO, also the government of Indonesia, which is to prevent the exchange organism from one region to another before we cleaning up. How ships do that? You know, in, this, in the one ships, there is a system or met methodology on the, um, uh, the name by what ballast water management, which is ships we're doing ballasting and de ballasting of water systems during the voyage. So our our marine family developed such kind of the mechanism and uh, and um, machineries to deal with the uh, cleaning water before ballast under the process of ballasting and de ballasting of the uh, ballast water in in the uh, in the ships. So there is our support on the um, um, uh, blue economy. And then uh, this ballast water management under our campaign uh, uh, trade name, Blue Sonic Ballast Water Management System. That's the one of the our technology on the supporting of blue economy. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, Bapak Shaiful, uh, for a comprehensive explanation. And uh, the explanation of Bapak Martin and Bapak Shaiful and also combined with the uh, explanation of Bapak Budi uh, Wibowo earlier is confirm the needs of uh, sustainability practices in the business and that we still can be sustainable while uh, return profit. Then uh, we move to uh, Ibu Shana Fatina and Bapak uh, Budi Wibowo. Uh, there is always opportunity and challenge in the implementations. Um, what kind of uh, challenge uh, do you face in uh, developing a sustainable blue economy in your sector, Ibu Shana? Uh, yes, well, about this blue economy is actually uh, really related with our sustainable tourism business. Yeah, well, in Labuan Bajo itself, uh, the most uh, interesting attraction is actually the diving and the sailing itself. And it, uh, it relates directly with the uh, marine ecosystem. And our challenge here is actually how to manage the balance between it. Uh, so first one, we built the, how we can manage uh, the balance between uh, tourism and also uh, preserving the marine ecosystem. And 
in the same time, for example, in Labuan Bajo, people are still um, knowing that uh, they are expected to have like a seafood and for day to day. So we have to balance that also because sometimes uh, you cannot have a uh, doing a marine a focus in a marine extraction in a location that you do to the eco to do to do the uh, sustainability in the eco park. So to achieve the our homework will be the first one, of course, the awareness of the community of the people, not only for the local people, but also the local governments about how to manage a sustainable marine uh, tourism and marine ecosystem to support this blue economy. Like we also don't have an, a big number of people. We only have a little um, number of people. So we have to manage this market education really right. The second was how to do the destination management. For example, you have to manage the attraction amenities and the facilities as the whole of the of the blue economy system also. And the third one, of course, the strategic partnership, the Penta Health collaboration, how to make a multi multilateral cooperation also uh, the best practice that happen in the uh, nationwide or worldwide can be used in Labuan Bajo itself. But basically, uh, we believe we have to start and that's why we start with a uh, big vision and one step ahead and how we can uh, implement this blue economy in Labuan budget supporting the sustainable tourism. Thank you. Thank you, Bushana, for a comprehensive explanation. And uh, to Bapak Budi, uh, this is also the same question, Pak. Uh, what is uh, the challenge you face in developing a sustainable blue economy uh, in your sector? The international market demand, especially in terms of sustainability and traceability, we have to continuously prove that through international certifications that we issue. But the problem is that those international certifications are so varied and mostly uh, cost uh, have a high cost, some even cost 50,000 US dollars and even above 100,000 US dollars. That is our main problem. So we really have to calculate the uh, how uh, the pros and cons to, as to having a national inter certification so that the cost that we have to be issued is in line uh, with the benefits that we can uh, reap. That is the, the, the main issue regarding international certification. That is why what we would like that there is a certificate, there are certificates, international certificates with lower cost, but uh, recognized uh, by the international world. And we hope that the uh, cost of the certification should not be borne only by us, but also by the buyers, they should contribute towards paying part of that certification cost. That would be my answer. We can highlight uh, several variables of the challenge that um, from Ibushana side, uh, we have the challenge of balancing tourism and conservation, mm -hmm. and also uh, destination management, and also the form of strategic partnership. And uh, from uh, Pak Budi's side, we have uh, the challenge, uh, the cost of quality by the international certification. And then um, we have um, other question. I have a follow-up question regarding to what uh, we have already discussed today uh, to Ibu Christina, Bapak Lars, uh, Bapak Martin, and Bapak Shaiful. Um, it's been uh, that you have been uh, penetrating uh, uh, the Indonesian market, and uh, how do you find uh, your technology could fit uh, with the blue uh, economy development in Indonesia? And um, how could you uh, support uh, the Indonesia, uh, I mean, that your company uh, support Indonesia uh, to reach its uh, potential? Ibu Christina. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of inquiries from Indonesia. <clears throat> and 
I know that we can make a difference in Indonesia. Uh, so we could help out with maybe making a pilot uh, in maybe waste of treatment plants. Then you can reuse the sludge as a resource to make biogas or, or a fertilizer, or yeah, help the industry to to clean up, <laughs> to don't let out that much pollution. So we can discuss pilots to help out industry-wise, um, because our goal is to grow outside Sweden and Europe, because we need to help out in, in different levels. So I, I gladly discuss yeah, our partnerships together. So we're looking for decision makers, or maybe if you have industry uh, deci decision makers that want to make some trials with our products, then we will gladly help out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ibu Christina, for sharing your thought. And uh, Bapak Lux, could you also uh, sharing um, your experience? Yes. Um, so two or three things that I believe is really uh, that could help Indonesia. The first one is that we are, of course, looking for a local partner. Uh, we can set up a joint venture according to the Indonesian law. In Korea, it was 49.51. So we have 49% there. In Taiwan, it's a 50-50 deal. Uh, and it differs in different markets. So first, uh, we need help finding a, a joint venture partner that would be interested in this. And we know, uh, we know exactly what would be the most, the best ones. Uh, the second one, um, the assessment we have done with our technology, it will fit perfect into your requirements of sustainability. We can support the fishery, the maritime, the whole tourist industry, uh, different things. One, we are uh, located far away from the islands as such. We can be located in really deep waters. Uh, the Korean one is down to 150 meters. We normally start with 50, 60 meters of depth. Uh, and also, uh, we have done and we do all these uh, feasibility studies, as mentioned also by our colleagues. So I have addressed the same to the uh, Swedish Indonesian uh, colleagues that uh, this is something that we really should uh, be discussing. I also discussed it with Svetfan that are positive. So if we can find the right local partner, the right local authority who would like to do this, we are ready to go, so to say. And I believe, honestly, that the experience we have from developing from extremely early stages would be more or less uh, transferred directly to, to Indonesia. Thank you, Bapa Lars, uh, for your sharing. And uh, I also have uh, the same question for uh, Bapa Martin and Bapa uh, Shaifu. Okay. Uh, Bapa. Um, yeah, so uh, more to there. Well, uh, first of all, uh, all the issues addressed today. I mean, if you look into the fishing industry, the important thing is to process the fish locally, sustainably, provide cooling in order to uh, reduce fish loss and the pressure on the coral reefs. Uh, and also for the local community to really export directly without middle people in between. With our solutions, we provide that. For the eco resource, for instance, in Labuan Bajo, uh, we look forward to focus on the actual need locally. We provide the project financing, we localize production, we do build and operate transfer mode to the local community within all these fields. So we can also uh, organize for the shipping community not to use heavy fuel oil or even gas oil for bunker heating to do the ballast water treatment and include the, in the solutions here into our solutions and provide uh, emission-free water and electricity when they're moored, et cetera. So with all those solutions, we have the capabilities. The important thing is go back to the pre-feasibility studies in order to show the business case. From that, we have no problem at all to do everything. Thank you, Bapak. And uh, Bapak Shaiful, could you please uh, share your thoughts uh, in this question? Yeah, sure. Uh, moderator, thank you. We, we, we are already here, Ibu. We are maybe 35, 36, I, if, as far as I recall, 35, 36 years in Indonesia. So uh, our strategy today 
is is we start we are developing the partnership our strategic alliance with government enterprise as well as the private enterprise in Indonesia. So so the beauty of the the strategic alliance or strategic partnership is that we can discuss in in helicopter view whole packages of technology and all the development and even we even we don't as a company we don't have such kind of the specific solution that they, they have but with that that the client needs or our partners needs but as a strategic partner or strategic alliance we can broaden our solution to this another partner and another resource from example swedish uh, company so strategic alliance coming to the questions what will be the the solution or what will be the the uh, way out to support the local industries and local companies here is that strategic partnership which is now we are uh, dealing with so much with both government enterprise as well as the private uh, sectors that's our answer we uh, moderator thank you very much thank you bapak shaiful for a comprehensive uh, explanation uh, we have the question from uh, youtube um, uh, dedicated for uh, ibu christina bapak lars and bapak martin uh, is there any uh, potential uh, collaboration uh, for the knowledge transfer from a Swedish company to uh, Indonesian uh, companies. Uh, can we start uh, by uh, Ibu Christina, please? Yes, all right. Um, I believe we can. Uh, I mean, the knowledge we have, why shouldn't we transfer it? Uh, we're doing a project right now in Sweden with the biggest waste for treatment plants that we have, trying to, to collect the floating sludge, and that creates positive effects on the water that we let out and also you can reuse it as a resource so of course we want to we can do that we just need a partner like Lars previously said um, so you can help out because it's different for us to just go to Indonesia we need someone to help us to yeah, know what's going to happen over there so yeah I would gladly transfer my knowledge in how do we treat wastewater because we are really good at that. We have done it so many years and we can sort of reuse it. So you can earn money and you get green or blue in this case. So yes, we would like to do that, but we need partners then. Okay, thank you, Christina and uh, Bapak Lars and followed by uh, Bapak Martin, please. Yes, I can add to what Christina said. Uh, we are always setting up a joint venture in the local market. That joint venture, which will be according to your law, will receive the, uh, the possibility to use our, our technology, uh, use the license. So we will hand over the license to the local company. And that means that this is really a business development opportunity for Indonesia, and also definitely for the local uh, environmental or the Nabona uh, Bajo region to develop something new. And as we do not compete with the, your interest, we add to your solutions. Uh, we believe that this could be a fantastic opportunity for the whole Indonesia. But as said many, many times, uh, feasibility studies is really what is giving us the opportunity and a local partner will enhance and, and develop this. Uh, Happy if we could start with uh, you and uh, Shana. Thank you, Papa Lars. And uh, Papa Martin, please. Yes, I mean, our whole concept is based on that we provide the project financing. We have started a company, Novo Vision, who do the visualizations and pre feasibility studies in a cost efficient way. We have our Sky Contract company who do all the legal documentation and legal design. We already have people foot on the ground. So I would also be, I think it's perfect to work both with the fishing community and with uh, Shana and Labuan Wadju, of course. The most important is that we have leads to business cases that we, through our mutual investment in feasibilities, can prove to the product financers and the end user that we have a sort of business case that survive on its own merits. 
And we have all the resources to do this already. I mean, we also work with Hexicon, for instance, for project in Finland, where we did the wind calculations together with them. So we can be very inclusive and uh, for sure, technology transfer. I mean, ambition is to produce locally that we operate until the local uh, community take over the operation and even the ownership of the plants. That's the whole business model. Thank you very much for uh, the explanation, Baba uh, Martin. Uh, following up um, uh, the share of thoughts from uh, Ibu Christina, Baba Lars, and uh, Baba Martin, I think um, I would like to borrow uh, the terminology from Baba Shaipul earlier that bridging the strategic alliance. And uh, do you think, Baba uh, Shaiful, uh, Baba Budi, and Ibu Shana? Uh, regarding uh, the explanation earlier by uh, our uh, Swedish partner today, what kind of uh, collaboration needed uh, between Swedish and uh, Indonesian stakeholders uh, to support the development of a sustainable blue economy in Indonesia? Uh, Ibu Shana. Okay, uh, well, it's really exciting to see uh, the opportunity and option and talk about and on the technology itself and the best practice already done there well uh, actually first one uh, it's important to see in a region basis so we know in indonesia is a different culture in, in in different islands in different sectors like that so um, we have to uh, embrace the local uh, community local culture how to adapt uh, how to adopt this technology and we can collaborate from not only for only for the procurement but only from the planning because actually um the government now already have like the blueprint for the blue economy and we can start from there and doing one, one by one and for especially in labuan bajo itself uh labuan bajo flores uh lembata alor i mean you've been here so you know uh, the potential here right so uh, it's not only about the marine resources but also uh, how we can uh, make a cooperation with the local people local community local entrepreneurs uh, to run this one so they will learn how to manage their uh, assets sustainably so not only for making the profit but also to preserve their environment also and last but not least uh, we have to be together to build the ecosystem because uh, this kind of like uh, blue economy not able to be done by one person or one entity, but how we can collaborate each other and how we can make uh, this uh, production can be um, in a one big value chain of Labuan Bajo Flores tourism itself, because actually we have challenge uh, in Labuan Bajo. Uh, most of our pro local products is came from outside so we are on our process at the moment how we can connect for example like uh, maybe fishing area in Sika and in Momere in area can supporting Labuan Bajo needs of seafood and etc so this kind of thing that we might able to develop also in uh, renewable energy like the hexagon state yeah um, well I don't know maybe like lower scale or depends on our situation here on the wind turbine and everything but basically we are committed to implement uh, this renewable energy uh, technology in Labuan Bajo Flores uh, tourism authority area so looking forward to work together uh, so shall we connect after this event and let's see what we can do together thank you so much thank you very oh. much Ibu Shana and Bapak uh, Shaiful and Bapak Budi yeah, yes thank you moderator I fully agree with Ibu Shana first of all what we what we call here in, in Indonesian terminology as a local wisdom. So first of all, we understand local wisdom. Then by understand people living in the um, archipelagic uh, model of the country, so many islands will be different in many ways of people living in continent. So by understanding local wisdom, you may understand the way they think, the way the way they um, uh, uh, behave, the way they, the, the um, uh, education, which is easy, which is a um, uh, model suits to them. <clears throat> so by understanding the local wisdom, then we, we continue to the understand to, to how we formulate the cooperation by strategic alliance that I mentioned before. The, 
doing strategic alliance, we will understand the complete portfolio and complete capabilities from the partners, both of us. We and our our alliance will be understand each other in complete portfolio and helicopter way. So we can we can understand each other, we can see each other, can fit each other. Which one that that I might have, my partner doesn't have, then we can I can fit. And vice versa, I don't have my partner might have, then we, they can fit. So keywords I would say is that first of all, yes, local wisdom. And, and the second thing, it will be strategic alliance to support and go together for the blue economy. That's maybe my answer, Bui. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bapak Shaiful. And uh, Bapak Budi, please welcome your thought, Bapak. Uh, terima kasih ya. Kami sangat senang, welcome. Kalau ada... Very happy if there are Swedish company that can give us or help us finding the right technology to improve the productivity of our fish production, for example, or to do an efficient use of our resources or an efficient cooling system or other technologies that would support our sustainability programs, including what I have stated before to have international certification. And to get there, I think we need further discussion, a more technical discussion. For example, in sectors such as aquaculture and also the other sectors in this industry. I think we need to have further discussion and we can also help connect our colleague from Sweden to collaborate with our local partners here. That would be all. Thank you. I would conclude that this forum uh, could be uh, act as a follow up for uh, private sector to support a sustainable blue economy. Uh, after uh, this forum. So um, Excellency, uh, Director, Head, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I could uh, summarize. summarize um, we have um, explored the potentials of a blue economy and uh, it presents a wide range of uh, opportunities so much from uh, tourism, fisheries, energies related that uh, provide solutions and uh, become uh, integral part in uh, achieving um, development uh, sustainability, as well as uh, to improve national economic growth, uh, create job opportunity that provides impact of uh, people welfare improvement and uh, national uh, economic recovery. Therefore, uh, it may become uh, the momentum, I think, for Indonesian uh, revival post uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also uh, from this uh, panel, we also conclude that uh, there is so much uh, follow-up action that can be taken uh, by private sector to support the government in uh, implementing a sustainable uh, blue economy. So thank you very much indeed, our uh, distinguished panelists uh, for sharing your thoughts and experience. And uh, to audience who are joining us today, I hope you inspire and enrich uh, by the experience that our distinguished uh, panelists have shared. Then uh, I hand over the floor uh, to the main room. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. And thank you, Ibu Vivik, for your excellent moderating of this large panel. And thank you to all panelist members, uh, both for sharing your insights, your perspectives, and uh, to the Swedish representatives for everything you can do. We're very much looking forward to uh, continuing these discussions as we move into next year. We've had many interesting discussions today and we will continue this work and we're very much looking forward now to uh, continuing to support the whole blue economy development for Indonesia, starting with 
the roadmap development, but then moving forward to concrete and specific projects. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, we will move on to the manufacturing industry and discuss the digitalization and modernization to increase international competitiveness. This is a new addition to the Sweden-Indonesia partnership. And we look forward to discussing how Sweden can support the implementation of the Making Indonesia 4.0 program. The Minister of Industry in Indonesia will join us also the CEO of Business Sweden and he will be sharing his insights on driving sustainable innovation in the private sector in Sweden. Furthermore, we will introduce an alliance of some of the finest Swedish technology providers with solutions in the areas of Internet of Things, Big Data and Artificial Intelligence. Companies like Ericsson, Hexagon, Atlas Copco, Synchronic and SKF will join with Indonesian industry stakeholders and together they will examine how to increase the international competitiveness of Indonesia by utilizing 5G technology to fast track the development in manufacturing industry. On the Indonesian side, we will hear from organizations like BKPM, Indonesia Research and Innovation Agency, Sapiens, Cominfo, and Jababeka Infrastructure. They will all share their perspectives on digitalization of the manufacturing industry and work with us to define how to best utilize the CISP Industry 4.0 Alliance for a successful, sustainable development of Indonesia. So ladies and gentlemen, this then concludes the fourth day of the Sweden-Indonesia Sustainability Partnership Week. We want to thank all the government representatives from both countries, the companies that joined us today and the topic experts from organizations both in Sweden and Indonesia. Until we see you again tomorrow. We wish you a great continued day and evening. Thank you. Terima kasih.